Good morning, everybody. Welcome to um, Monday, May 10th meeting of the Electoral Area Services Committee. I'll call the meeting to order. Um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with Ministerial Order 192, public in-person attendance isn't permitted, but we are streaming live on YouTube. Um, and please uh, do go to our website and um, you can follow the links if you want to follow this live and then it'll be archived there as well. Um, before we begin, I just want to recognize that we're meeting on the unceded and traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. We don't have any delegations, but we have a management report for receipt. On receipt? Move receipt. Moved and seconded. Are there any comments on the items? Seeing none. All in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. And moving on, we have some advisory planning commission meeting minutes for receipt. We have moved and seconded for all four sets uh, of minutes for area A, area C, ag advisory, and then a seconded area B. Any comments on those minutes? Okay. Um, anyone opposed to receipt? Seeing none, that's carried. And moving on to the first item then, the report, Electoral Area A Development Variance Permit for 6650 Island Highway South Lata. Moved report. Moved and seconded, and I'll move, move it over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors, and Dylan Thiessen is here to present this report and answer any of your questions. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for that introduction, Russell, and thank you, Directors, for your time this morning. A development variance permit application has been received to consider a reduction in the front yard setback for a single detached dwelling. The subject property is a corner lot situated at 6650 Island Highway South, and the front yard lot line is adjacent to Island Highway South, as well as an unopened MOTI right-of-way named Craft Road. The development as proposed would meet the minimum front yard setbacks for Island Highway South, and the applicants are asking for a six meter setback pertaining to Craft Road, so a reduction of one and a half meters. It is worth noting that if the board adopts updates to the zoning bylaw that staff are currently in the process of drafting, the lot line subject to this variance would be considered a side yard lot line adjacent to a road and would be subject to a four and a half meter setback. The Advisory Planning Commission for Area A considered this at their April 6 meeting and voted in favor of the application noting that maintenance, privacy, and safety issues are still addressed through the development as proposed. Staff also sent mail outs to adjacent property owners and tenants within a 100 meter radius, but received no comments. The applicants are aware of the province's requirements for an archeological assessment. They have already begun this process and will adhere to any provincial regulations in that regard. And staff are recommending that the variance be approved as there is significant space remaining within a six meter setback requested for building maintenance and to ensure privacy to and from adjacent properties. Additionally, should Craft Road ever be opened as a roadway, there will be sufficient space for sight lines to be maintained. I'll note that the property owners and applicant are uh, on Zoom and are willing to talk to the application as well. We'll both be available for questions. Thanks, Dylan. And I'll just turn it over to the applicant. If you have any comments you'd like to add to that presentation. You can just unmute yourself. <laughs> um, no, the Lattas don't have anything to add. Dave Pearden is on our behalf and it looks like he's struggling with his mute button, so. <laughs> I don't think he had anything to add either. Okay, great. Well, do any of the directors have any questions for or comments on the, no? Well, then I'll thank you for, um, for being made available today. Um, I'll call the question on receipt then. On receipt, is anyone all in favor? Anyone opposed? And we've got the, the recommendation to consider. 
Great, thank you. That the Cumlock Valley Regional District approved the development permit for Letta to reduce the front yard setback pertaining to Craft Road from seven and a half meters to six meters. And finally, the corporate legislative officer be authorized to execute the permit. Anyone opposed to that recommendation? Seeing none, that is carried. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, next item, electoral area C request for letter of concurrence for 3301 Macaulay Road um, in Poutledge Black Creek for receipt. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Over and to staff. Thank you very much, Chair of Directors. And Dylan Thiessen will uh, leave you with this report and answer any of your questions. Thank you again, Russell and Directors. Staff have received a request from TELUS Communications for a letter of concurrence regarding their proposal for the development and construction of a new telecommunications tower located at 3301 Macaulay Road. While TELUS and their infrastructure and land use is regulated solely by the federal government, Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada required confirmation from the relevant local government that the company has satisfactorily consulted with the local government and have completed the required public consultation process. Section 25 of the official community plan discusses infrastructure with three points being directly related to telecommunications towers. That a company's proposed development utilize and incorporate natural topography of the site and conserve environmental features. That they attempt to co-locate their infrastructure on existing towers and that they host a public information meeting prior to its development and construction. The current proposal minimizes encroachment onto an ALR property there are unfortunately no opportunities for co-locating on an existing tower and TELUS hosted an online public engagement session on January 28th, which was advertised in the January 20th and January 27th editions of the Comox Valley Record. A referral was sent to staff in the bylaw enforcement, fire services, engineering and parks departments and no concerns were raised about the development as proposed. The development proposal was also considered by the Advisory Planning Commission for Area C and the Agricultural Advisory Planning Commission. Both APCs were in favor of the proposal, noting that the siting maintains a safe distance between the tower and a nearby wetland area, maximizes the amount of land on the property that can still be used for agricultural purposes, and provides a much needed servicing upgrade to the community. Staff recommend that the request for a letter of concurrence be approved and that TELUS be provided with the appropriate documentation as all OCP requirements have been met. I will note that Brian Gregg is also on the Zoom call and he is with SitePath Consulting representing TELUS for this application. Thank you very much. And I know the, the directors have received an email. We will discuss that after um, discussing the report as presented, if that's all right. So does anyone have any comments or questions to staff regarding this report? Director Gree. Thank you. Uh, I understand Brian's on the line as well. Um, more of a comment. I think this goes a long way to show the disconnect sometimes between uh, the rural and urban areas. Uh, although it's not captured in the minutes because we don't really capture any of the discussion. It's pretty basic, your APC minutes, as you know. Um, one of the questions that was asked was um, being that they're running a fiber optic line all the way up to the site on Macaulay Road, was there a chance of uh, putting in a, a downlink uh, for the DSL service up there? And I guess the proponent, when he heard uh, fiber optic, he was probably thinking that the, that the APC members were asking about fiber optic direct to house kind of super high speed hookup that's fairly common in urban areas. But I think that what they're, so that just goes to show right there that, uh, you know, that that's not it. We're just asking for something that's, that's uh, going to deliver enough bandwidth and fast enough so that, uh, you know, mom and dad can participate in Zoom meetings and the kids can do their homework. And it does beg the question um, that, uh, you know, we, we're looking at, a, at these, these uh, internet providers and, and telecom providers out there who basically, um, you know, pick the pockets of, of uh, the Comox Valley residents to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. But when we talk about, you know, some community benefit, 
um, you know, that's not, not my department. Like Brian said, well, I don't work in that part of the company, but you know, I mean, I think it needs to be, it needs to be brought forward that if we don't have any opportunities at all to put any pressure on any of these providers, we've got areas that are, that are in dire need of moving into the 21st century. So um, I would just wonder if there's anything we can do maybe on the side or Brian can take back to his bosses. I know it's not his department, but you're talking to somebody who works in local government and government of course is an expert of, of uh, you know, sending people around in circles from not my department to, you gotta talk to the, uh, the uh, federal provincial ministries or what have you. So, I mean, it can be done, but I think the message has to get, get out that you can't just keep coming to the community and, and not giving anything back. So I just wonder if Brian has any comments on that. Yes, yeah, so your comment. Yeah, go thank ahead. you um, for the question there. Yeah, and I did take notes on on this topic during our our previous meeting, and I have shared it with with my colleagues and the powers that be at Telus. Uh, the intent in mentioning it that's a sort of a separate department. In in no way am I trying to uh, sort of pass the buck, if you will. It's just uh, you know I have a fairly specific project that I'm task to work on here as a consultant for TELUS. And it, it, I would say it is a, is a community benefit. Um, you know, respect way the feedback you provided there sort of put a, I would say maybe a bit of a negative spin, but we are trying to deliver um, both voice service, so cell phone service, as well as uh, potentially wireless high-speed internet access. So people can connect through the wireless network uh, to mm -hmm. high-speed internet services. Um, and certainly that can be explored with regards to, you know, connecting fiber into the main hub and uh, distributing from there. I know you weren't asking for necessarily fiber to each, each mm -hmm. home or anything like that. So um, that has been noted, but uh, th those kinds of requests, as you can imagine, even our cell site project here, uh, these are our multi-year um, plans. We have a three-year plan and uh, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be able to sort of immediately commit to something like that, I don't think. But I think the discussion should go on and we should stay in touch on it. And I'll put you in touch with the right people to facilitate um, that discussion. But while related, um, they are also separate um, initiatives, separate funding streams that tell us completely different people. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily uh, directly tie the two together, if, if you will. Well, you know, this is a matter of principle of me voting against this because I think it needs to be addressed. I mean, we can all pass a buck. As I say, government's great at doing that. We can send you around circles for months. So I think it, it needs to be recognized that it is a crisis. It is almost a human right now. It's essential to not only work but to schooling and in a, we have areas that are five minutes outside the city Courtney that's not connected mm -hmm. so um this is a matter of putting a i understand it's about a, a seventy thousand dollar switch in the ditch that they put in on the fiber optic so um just well, to get the message through like i say i'm not not in support thank you may i reply yes please go ahead so by, if you were to not move this project forward, it would only uh, prevent, I would say, uh, the type of service that I think you're desiring. This will deliver not only um, voice service on the cellular network, which is obviously important for convenience, for phone calls, for public safety, for economic development. It will also enable people uh, to connect, uh, whether it's you know, for school or work, uh, you know, remote working, all the items you just mentioned, you can do um, quite well if you're within our coverage area uh, through this communication site. So I'm not suggesting in any way that it's a replacement for fixed line services or for broader delivery of fiber like you're wanting. I'm totally aligned with you on that. I think that's an absolutely um, valid and an excellent request, but I'm not sure that um, rejecting uh, this what I would say is a step in the right direction um, would necessarily achieve the, the benefit that you're, you're hoping for. Um, we are trying to deliver some of those precise services through this proposal. 
And again, it doesn't replace in any way what you're looking for. Um, we can continue to work with you on that and would like to do that. Brian, I believe Director Arbor's got a question or a comment. Yes, thank you. Um, in terms of the, uh, the project itself, um, I mean, the, the recommendation before us is, is really commenting on the satisfactory nature of the public consultation. I'm just wondering, um, we did receive a- uh, We haven't received it on- We time. haven't received it. Um, so, yeah, I'm just wondering if, if uh, any risks in terms of deferring the decision today to the next meeting or anything like that, is there, is there any implication either for the proponent or um, our own processes if uh, we just table this for a month? Uh, perhaps Brian can touch more on the TELUS's direct perspective, but from staff perspective, if you were to vote against the letter of concurrence request, um, there is a mediation process in place by the federal government that would begin. If you were to simply postpone it or delay or ask staff to further look into this, uh, I don't believe that that would trigger that requirement. I think we could just bring this forward next meeting. Sure, I, I can top up on that if you want. Like we're, we're not looking to, to go to any kind of dispute resolution process or whatever. I think the bigger risk is just, we have um, funding committed for certain amounts of time and um, you know, I say that gently, it's not, not intended to sound like some kind of a, a threat or whatever, but um, you know, I have been working on this for quite some time. I think this is the fourth or fifth um, committee and or board type meeting I've been to. Um, you know, overwhelmingly, I think the community has expressed a desire for the service and our, our consultation went well. And it just seems like um, it has been quite a long and fulsome process I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to give you any additional clarity or information um, if you were to delay it. Um, of course, that's up to you uh, as a as a regional district. But um, I, I'm just not sure what what more information you would really have in front of you. Certainly from us, anyway. Okay, I think that that answers uh, Director Harper's question. Um, are there any other comments to either staff or to, to Brian? We'll go just on receipt then. On receipt, is there anyone opposed to that report? See none, that is carried. We do have a late minute, a last minute item on the addendum for receipt um, regarding correspondence of May 10th from Sharon Clark and Bill Engelson. Will I'll we see. consider the addendum? Moved. And seconded. Um, so we'll put that on the table. Um, I think most of the directors had a chance to look at, at the email. And do you have any comments or questions regarding that? Uh, move received the agenda. Oh, sorry, move and seconded. So on receipt. Do we want to vote first or do you want to comment first? Yeah. Yes, we'll, do, we'll discuss. So, Director Arbor, please. Yeah, thank you. And, and this is a, a, a late submission, though I understand there had been prior discussions with staff or otherwise. <clears throat> and, I, and, I, and I do hear the comments from uh, the proponent and in the staff report as well that I think we, we did. Uh, we know there is quite a bit of support for uh, this type of service in this type of area. And, and I actually myself um, vocalized that at a prior meeting that I think it's important to try to get access for people to uh, internet and phone services in rural areas and that this project does achieve that. This particular uh, correspondence is related really to uh, the siting uh, of, of, of the tower. And uh, I mean, in my own community, we had a lot of debates around that and uh, on Hornby and where it left us in the end is that we have no service. Telus was proposing a $1 million project. The community showed uh, some concerns around siting and things like that. And here we are five years later and there is no project on the horizon. 
So it's a tough one, uh, and I understand the concerns of, of the nearby residents, but uh, that's partly why, because it came very late yesterday, I thought maybe we would press the pause button for a month. So I'd, li I'd like to, um, to hear from staff whether they feel that those uh, conversations with the, the, the individuals who sent us the letter, whether you, and also with the proponent, whether you see whether there's flexibility on the one side to make site adjustment, and maybe Brian will comment on that. And second, if you see any other type of resolution around this particular issue. Maybe we'll ask staff to comment and then Brian. Hi, thank you for your comment, Director Harbour. Appreciate that. Uh, certainly, Brian can talk about the specifics involved on Telus's end in relocating this type of infrastructure, but from a CVRD perspective, there are three subsections, three clauses within the official community plan that directly relate to this type of telecommunications tower. Um, siting is not one of them, unfortunately, the local government, in, particularly in this case, when the use and development is regulated solely by the federal government are relatively limited. Um, and TELUS and Site Path Consulting have um, satisfactorily met all of the relevant regulations within the official community plan. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave my comments there, but I'm happy to answer any further questions. Um, I'm not sure, Brian, if you had a chance to see the email or if you were copied at all um, from the local resident. Um, I'm, I don't know that I'm, I have been in receipt of that particular email, but certainly um, uh, Ms. Clark and I had, I would say, more correspondence on this proposal than, than anyone else um, by a large margin. So I'm, I'm well aware of, of her opinions and, and feedback and concerns um, and have responded to all of those in, in a lot of detail. And because I wasn't able to I guess, sort of close the loop on those concerns or respond in a way that she was satisfied with. I actually did ultimately um, share all of her comments and all of my responses um, with the regional contact at Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, just to make sure that I was transparent and had correctly responded to all the reasonable and relevant concerns. And they deemed that that was indeed the case. Uh, Ultimately, um, Ms. Clark's request, I believe, and there was a lot of them to, to be sure, so I'm not trying to exclude any of her, her feedback, but the, I, I believe the only way that she would feel that the concern was resolved is if I were to completely uh, move the tower um, further into the subject property. I think that was the primary request. Um, there's a couple comments I would have in relation to that, just to sort of clarify um, you know, our response to that key item. Um, first of all, we heard from, I believe your um, agriculture or farmer committee that um, it was appreciated that we were setting our infrastructure uh, close to Macaulay Road uh, and not building power line and road further into the lot, taking up more space on agricultural land. So effectively the request from Ms. Clark would would sort of be a counter to that type of land use thinking from an agricultural perspective. Also, you know, we, we do need to have our infrastructure sited reasonably close to supporting infrastructure like fiber optics and power, as well as access roads. Um, so there's all kinds of reasons, and I could list many more as to why we proposed it where we did. Uh, and, you know, the last comment I would provide, which you know, perhaps is neither here nor there, certainly for Ms. Clark, uh, and, and maybe not for, for some people here at this meeting, uh, but we would actually have to completely, everything I've done through this consultation would be useless and we'd have to start all over again from the beginning if we move the tower, redo our newspaper notice, redo our open house, um, redo our mail out, redo all of our drawings. And so people again would have to go through the entire process and it would set us back by about a year I don't know if we would still have the funding on the table. And so there's all kinds of um, challenges. It's not a simple ask that I could just say, okay, let's move it, no problem. Um, and then my final comment would be that if you look at the results of our consultation, I think only three people were opposed to the location and 12 were supportive. And then six people were somewhat neutral or just looking for information. So. Um, just more generally, I would say, while we recognize that certainly not everyone is satisfied, and you know, frankly, it's very tough to satisfy everyone, um, by and large, uh, we feel that this location has a logic to it. It was 
reasonably supported and um, there would be a lot of drawbacks um, in terms of timing um, as well as land use if we were to shift to a new location. Thank you for that. Uh, Director Arbor? Yeah, thanks. From what I hear from both and staff and, uh, and TELUS is uh, I, I, fortunately, I don't see a lot of benefits to be gained in deferring a month, as I suggested earlier. So I guess it's kind of decision time based on the available information. Um, and um, yeah, and, uh, unfortunately for the people who, who are have shared that concern with TELUS, I think I end up on balance leaning on supporting it um, based on all the benefits it will bring to the community, emergency services, all these different things. Having lived that in my community and, and seeing it not happen and get really shoved to the back burner, it's painful. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that TELUS will work, continue to work with um, the neighbors that are, are, are concerned in trying to implement as many mitigated measures as possible as, as listed and all the rest of that. But at the end of the day, it's not my purview. And I realize I can only just encourage TELUS to really try to do it. At the same time, I'm just stating my current intent of vote. And I realize this is an area C and, and, and director's grief. So I'll be looking to his, uh, his thoughts and, and will be supportive of the course of action. Thank you. Thanks, Director Arbor. And I'll, I'll just also comment in, you know, I, I know how important it is to have this, um, this type of infrastructure in rural areas, um, not having had high speed internet when we first moved to our property in Area B and what a difference it has made in our um, ability to farm as well as work from home. Um, but as was mentioned, it is in Area C and um, I, I do, I, I, I feel for the, um, you know, uh, Ms. Clark and, and Mr. Engelson and their concerns of having a, a tower close to them. But at the same time, I do also concur that um, seeing as it is on farmland, um, having a tower, and I've seen towers in the middle of fields, how difficult it is to, to farm around them um, because it's not just um, the tower itself, it's the buried, um, all the buried uh, lines that you have to be very careful around. So. Um, you know, I think our farmers do do point out a, a really important point. Um, so just that's my comments um, on that. So any other comments on, on the addendum that we're, we've just received? Okay, seeing none, I'll just vote on receipt. Um, all in favor of receipt of the addendum? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. So we're back up to the item. Um, is there a recommendation? Director Grief. Thank you very much. I'd like to remove the recommendation, but with a, uh, 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 finally that um, the, the, uh, the letter of approval um, contains some language around the possibility of uh, them considering using the uh, fiber optic connection to feed back into the DSL system up there. Not everybody is going to have Wi-Fi uh, systems, but uh, so if we can put some kind of language in there, even just just one sentence, just something to let the big wigs back in Toronto know that, uh, you know, that it's a little different out here in the country. And you have to consider that when you keep going to the public and asking for concessions. Thank you. Thanks for the motion. Do we have a second? I, I I'd like to us to be more specific in, in language um, and that we kind of, that's, so I know what I'm voting on. Um, not that I'm not supportive, I just think that that sentence should be a little clearer, whether it's and to encourage yeah. TELUS to further explore fiber optic opportunities in the area, or you want something stronger than that. How about further, further explore utilizing the fiber optic connection in that area? Yes, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Yeah, I'm just gonna wait to see if, um, if Lisa's been able to capture that in the, in the language of the motion. Further explore the possibility of 
enhancing fiber optic connections. And Director Grieve, did you want to say in all of Comox Valley's rural area, or you were specific about that particular? Well, I think we'll just concentrate our minds on, on this one, and the next time we'll bring it up again. Oh, it's uh, with the letter of approval. Oops, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Letter of approval contained language around the possibility of using the fiber optic connection to feed back into the DSL system. Is that, does that capture your discussion? Do we need DSL in there? I guess possibly, yeah. Uh, DSL, okay. yeah, but what do they call that download? They, the download switch or whatever. Is it, Madam Chair, process-wise, is it appropriate to uh, just get one sentence from our consultant while he's there to see if, uh, if this Maybe is something? It, it's only been moved. It's it hasn't only been, been moved. Hasn't so. seconded. No, I haven't seconded it yet. With you. Um, maybe Elisa, that it should say, and finally, that the letter of approval requests TELUS's consideration of the possibility of using the fiber optic connection to feedback back into the system. Okay. I think that would be fair. And then of the possibility. So get rid of contain language. The directors, I'm just trying to um, yep. get your expression. Is that reflected? Thank you. I still, I still, if possible, process wise, a brief word from the consultant, whether he thinks that holds together. Brian, is that a possibility for you to comment on that motion? Yeah, I, I think it's reasonable. I've seen from time to time um, sort of addendums um, to our concurrence wording um, like this or for different matters. As, as long as the concurrence language itself is clear um, for approval of the proposed tower and the land use concurrence piece and that we've satisfactorily completed our consultation, as long as that side of it's all clear, um, you know, and your ad addendum doesn't conflict with that somehow, which I don't believe it does in any way, um, you know, encouraging tell us to to further expand its and improve upon its fiber services, I think is a welcome addendum that, that wouldn't in any way um, be an issue in my mind. Thank you. So do we have a second then on that? Second on that? Thank you. Thank you. We've had some discussion. Is there any more? Hearing none. All in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. And thanks, Brian. Thank you. We're moving on to item number four, uh, site-specific floodplain setback reduction for uh, Slater and Dutton um, for receipt. Moved. Moved and seconded and over to staff. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and Directors. And Brian Chow is here to present this report and answer any of your questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Russell through the chair to the committee members. <clears throat> the subject property is an undeveloped waterfront lot at Lens Road in Electoral Area A. The owners would like to build a single detached dwelling, an accessory dwelling unit, either a secondary dwelling or carriage house, that's landscaping and related residential development on the property. In accordance with the CVRD floodplain management bylaw, uh, an engineer has to determine the minimum floodplain setback and flood construction level for the year 2100. The applicants hired, hired an engineer and he determined that the minimum flood construction level for the year 2100 to be 5.04 meters and the minimum floodplain setback to be 15.15 meters. During the design of the project, the proposed single detached dwelling requires an elevator to provide barrier free access from the garage on the bottom floor to the living space on the second floor. And the lower part of the elevator would not meet the aforementioned minimum flood construction level. 
Therefore, a floodplain exemption application is required. In addition, the proposed development includes fill as part of the landscape plan to be placed within the floodplain setback area. And therefore, um, the proposed fill is also part of the floodplain exemption request as well. The engineer consider or analyze the proposal. And according to the engineer for the proposed elevator, the electrical and mechanical workings are above the minimum flood construction level and the elevator car can be moved or raised above the flood construction level during um, events in the future. And the engineer deems the proposed elevator to be safe for intended use. For the proposed fill, the engineer recommends a uh, one meter concrete trench to be placed in front of the house uh, facing the ocean to work with the proposed fill to protect the proposed dwelling in uh, flood events. And the engineer confirms that the fill is not expected to be a safety hazard or cause any negative impacts to the neighbors. Should the CVRD board grant an exemption, um, this floodplain bylaw requires the property owners to prepare and register a section 219 restrictive covenant that releases and indemnifies the CVRD from liability in the event of any damage caused by flooding or erosion. Staff is in support, staff is in support of approving the floodplain exemption. And as an added part, there's a map archeological site on the property and the owners were given the provincial notification letter and were requested to follow the directions from the province to follow up with any archeological matters required. The agent, Bill Lane is on Zoom, as well as the owners, Tim Slater and Peter Dutton are also on Zoom and they're available to answer any questions um, the commission members may, the committee members may have, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Brian. Um, would the proponents or their, um, their uh, representative like to say anything to the committee? Um, Jimmy there. Just thank you for your consideration. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and do directors have any questions or comments to staff or the proponent? No, oh, Director Grief. Thanks very much, Madam Chair. Um, so we're looking at an elevation about three and a third meters above sea level, is that correct? Um, that will be correct uh, because the flood construction level is determined by geodetic elevation. The engineer confirmed that to be 5.04 meters and the proposed living space for the house is above that. It's just the elevator uh, shaft and uh, the bottom elevator um, because the way elevator needs to work, um, that's, that's not meeting the minimum flood construction level and therefore requires a uh, flood plane variance. So obviously the covenant would be in place to protect us should in the future time the sea decide to uh, come in their back door. And you're talking about a seawall, is that correct? Uh, through the chair to committee members, uh, no. The engineer is proposing uh, right in front of the house uh, facing the ocean. The engineer is proposing a one meter wide trench a trench. And then uh, to be filled with um, concrete and the fill be placed on top so that they work together to protect their house uh, should the flood water comes towards the house uh, in flood events. So it's not a seawall and it's, so it's not a flood, uh, it's not a shoreline protection device. It's part of the uh, features to protect the house. So then this is in keeping with our, our Green Shores initiatives. Yes, this is in keeping because uh, this feature is not at the ocean, it's at the house. And the house is at, uh, around 16 meters from the ocean. Thank you very much. Some people like to live dangerously. Any other comments? Director Arbor. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I don't believe this one came to the APC, correct? Comments on staff rationale? Okay, see Madam Chair to committee members. 
uh, floodplain exemption request uh, does not go to APC as it's uh, purely an engineer uh, review and confirmation and, uh, and that the engineering reports will be registered as a covenant for protection and to um, save the CVR, the harmless from any flooding. Mm -hmm. So because it's a very technical uh, permit uh, in nature, um, it's, it's not been the practice or process to send to APC. Thanks. I'm, I may like to revisit that in the future because I think there's often other elements of proposals like that that I'm sure would be considered. And, and I actually don't object to the, the design and what's before us. And I don't think many people would, but there's connected issues that I'm sure the APC would have brought, um, would have brought forward. Uh, for example, this is one of four properties where the, the Royston Seaside Trail, people get sent onto the beach and they're just, they're, it's actually in the gap between the sea. So I don't know if parks have talked about that at all, because when you're talking about floodplain and changes to the foreshore, I don't know if there's been communication with the homeowners around the fact that their, their property in area A is, is really, the, along with three others are really the only place where we have a gap and people get pushed onto the beach and whether there would be a partnership opportunity around um, the work that's being proposed so that, you know, I, I, can't, I can't drop this on the homeowners today or on staff, but this is the type of things and, and conversations that I think the APC would have caught pretty quickly. So um, I don't know what to do because it's late in the project. It's obviously, I mean, the design looks good, but I, I'm, I just think there may be a big missed opportunity in, in possible collaboration on, on this thing. And unfortunately I stand alone without any of my APC members having had a look at it. So I'm just making a general comment. I'll, I'll turn it back to the chair and, and think about um, my, you know, my support for, for what's before us today. Thanks. Looks like Tan has a comment. Through CEO to the chair, to Director Arbor. I just wanted to follow up on Brian's comments too. Um, uh, the reason why it wasn't sent to the APC is um, the reports that uh, we received from the geotech is a very technical report. Um, the report um, in, in our I believe it's um, it's that staff and their engineer that they hired will work together to ensure that it meets our policies within our OCP and our zone bylaw. Um, uh, regards to um, internal referral staff did send comments to the parks department and engineering and building to ensure that that everything is in compliance to our regulations. So um, in the past, we have never sent anything to the APC just due to the technical uh, component of, of, their, of the report. Um, okay. it, it, I, I understand that it's just, Am I just dreaming or there's just a missed piece that even if we talk to the homeowner around the works that's being proposed and all that, even looking at 50 years after they're done owning the property, whether there's opportunities to think about what a trail could look like and all these different things. It feels like that's, as we're dealing with a pretty small strip of land on the shore and knowing the strategic value of that little piece of land that I'm surprised that that wasn't caught in our processes and, and that what comes today will lead to potentially a lot of dollars being spent by the homeowners, which really shape the direction and the future of, of that particular uh, approach. Yeah, um, in order to address your concerns, there's one of two ways. It would be to defer this uh, consideration to ask staff to evaluate that further. If, if this specific application has some concerns and you want want further consideration, if it's about process, then it might be a resolution to for staff to come back with uh, uh, a process whereby these applications would be considered by APC or, or some other act, activities would occur before they come forward. Go ahead, Director. Yes, thank you. And if I may, like I know the, uh, the agent or the engineer and maybe the homeowners, I think you say might be on the line. So I, I don't want to set a negative tone to it either, uh, which I probably am. <laughs> but at the same time, it's, 
yeah, yeah, I do. I do think it's important to make sure that we check some of those other boxes uh, before these kinds of projects. So my question would be the same as with the TELUS one. Um, what is the cost of, of deferring a month on this and for staff to, to have a second look and maybe talk with the homeowners again? Maybe they have no appetite to uh, look at a collaboration and things will end there. Or maybe they want to speak to that today. Um, but uh, I, I just feel it's my, it's my job to raise these concerns. Thank you. Does staff have any comments, uh, Brian? Yes, uh, through the CEO to the chair and committee members. Uh, an internal referral was circulated uh, in this type of, in all applications that we do. And the feedback I got from the parks department is just the comments on using Lynn's Road as part of their, um, the, the trail system. Uh, the feedback I got from parks department was not uh, uh, about that water, uh, the Royston Trail at all. Is just talking about lens roll being used as part of their um, uh, the future driveway. Lens roll right now is an unopened road. And so that's the extent of the feedback I got. So there's no uh, uh, much of a, uh, the Royston uh, Trail. So I, I just want to paint a picture so everybody here is on the same page, right? And, and again, so at the Royston Seaside, you guys know the investment CVRD has done around in the barbecue at Marine Beach and all these different things. And then the breakwater, all these different things, right? So we've, we've put in 15 years of effort into developing this project. And we partnered with the city of Courtney, which has now last year extended and negotiated with a number of property owners to move towards us. The end outcome of that is that pretty soon, we will have a connection from the Fifth Street Bridge for a path all the way to Royston, except for where those four properties are located. They're the only piece of the puzzle that we haven't resolved. Um, so that parks would just look at Lynn's Road. So what currently happens is people get there and then they have a choice. They go down to the beach to connect, which obviously accessibility issues, or they go up Lynn's Road back to the Allen Highway. <laughs> back down the next road, right? It's, it works, but I'm just saying. So, you know, I think I will have, if our parks department does not see it, the opportunity there, um, either there's a really closed doors with those four homeowners, so it's not worth pursuing at this time, but I will take the advice of staff. I got a feeling that I will have to approve this thing today because if it was internally referred and we didn't catch on to it, then it's on us, you know? Um, Okay, I'll leave it. Thanks for. Thanks, Director Arbor. And um, Director Grief. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have to uh, agree with uh, Director Arbor that we worked very hard to try to get uh, connectivity with our trails. And, and uh, it seems odd that uh, interdepartmentally, this isn't a lens that they look at everything. Um, unfortunately, for the property owner, I mean, this is. This is the only time that we have any hammer at all. And I think that the public good must be looked after, um, you know, uh, over and above the, the property owner. I see it as some, some opportunity to work um, collaboratively with the, with the other two neighbors as well. But uh, unless we bring this forward and have a part of, of, of every day so that, uh, it's, it's one of those things that's always a little box we need to check off, you know, that uh, I know it's a, a technical engineering report and all that, but I think it's very important that we look at the broader picture and uh, this is our one and only opportunity. If we don't, if we don't get these, these uh, greenways and pathways and parkways now, they'll be lost for all time. Thank you for your comment. Um, I, I suggest that given the board's concerns and uh, I would suggest that you re refer this to your con consideration of this committee in one month's time and staff will get back to you on the matters that you've raised. Okay, what's the will of the committee? Um, on receipt, I, I guess we should first vote. So um, is there anyone opposed to receipt of the report? Seeing none, that is approved. And then for a recommendation, what, what's the will? Yeah, I, I, some, some, I guess, in, in 
staff won't like me saying that, but apologies to the homeowners. But uh, but yeah, I'll move deferral uh, to, to our next meeting, giving staff the time to come back to us with providing a better understanding and maybe talking to the homeowners whether there's opportunity there or not around collaboration. Thank you. Okay. Moved and seconded. And any comment on that? And I have to say, I concur that this is, um, you know, a good opportunity. And I hope that there are some um, synergies that can happen to support both the homeowner as well as the RD to to get what um, each each want. So, um, on that motion, I'll call the question. Uh, I'll, anyone opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. So that item has been deferred for our next meeting. Um, Item number five, um, electoral area C rezoning application for uh, Macaulay Road and 8723 Island Highway for receipt. Move report. Moved and seconded and over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Jody McLean is here to present this report and answer any of your questions. Thank you. The CEO, the Chair and Directors. If you have your reports handy, uh, pages eight and nine will illustrate the properties that are subject to this application. And the applicants, Rob Layton and the agent, Rob Kevin Brooks, I believe, are online there. So the applicant has purchased the Saratoga Speedway and the neighboring properties. In the regional growth strategy and the official community plan, these properties are within a settlement node, which are areas intended to accommodate more complete communities with places for residents, employment, and recreation. But the specific type and location and density of the development is subject to servicing capacity and considerations and feedback within the rezoning process. On page 21 of the report, you can see what they're proposing there. Proposing to rezone this area to a zone that would allow for the development of a recreational vehicle campground, a larger area suitable for what the zoning bylaw calls outdoor recreation, which includes auto racing, as well as other commercial uses. Also proposed in this is a special events to be listed as a permitted use. Properties with with uh, special event listings are those that are set up to host special events without the special events permit. Acknowledging the water capacity limit in the Black Creek Oyster Bay water system, the applicants are proposing to service the RV park solely from a private on-site well with the remainder of the development serviced by the public uh, BCOB system. Appendix B in your package there lists the external agencies that are recommended for receiving uh, the specific referral at this point. After receiving their comments, staff can report back to this committee with a draft zone. Madam Chair, the other part of the recommendation also allows the CBRD to consider voluntary community amenity contributions as that may come with this, this proposal. Thank you. Thank you to staff. And I believe the proponents are on the line. Would you have anything that you wanted to add or? Thank you, Chair and, uh, and uh, members. Uh, my name is Kevin Brooks. I'm the senior planner uh, with McElhaney, the agent for Mr. Layton on this file. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. McLean. Mr. McLean did an excellent job uh, summarizing the overall proposal. Now, uh, one thing that I did want to mention is that the proposed uses that we have are consistent with the existing zoning. Um, the challenge with the property now is it is split zoned, uh, even though a lot of the uses being proposed are currently permitted because of the split zoning on the parcel. Our intent really was to regularize the zone over the entire parcel to be able to operate and manage the, uh, the speedway in a consistent manner. Uh, across the, the entire portion of land that we, we do uh, have obtained, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for the project itself. Um, the Speedway has been operating for approximately 40 years. And so it's really about regularizing the existing uses 
uh, to allow us to continue to operate this weekend. Um, Mr. Layton and I would be happy to take any questions that uh, the members may have. Thank you. Do the directors have any questions for either staff or the proponent? Director Grief. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, regarding the uh, servicing the campsite with um, on-site water, um, that certainly would uh, play out very well in, uh, in my community because as you probably know, there is concerns over the Black Creek Oyster Bay water system. But um, I know it, that uh, you guys have done a lot of work on this and um, certainly uh, I, I've got very few people in the community that are, that are opposed to it. So I would say that I, I, uh, I think it's favorable. Um, I understand you've actually uh, um, built some of your fencing with the wood that was milled from the property. So, I mean, there you go, it's pretty sustainable. And uh, my question would be around, um, around the capacity of the well. I'm just wondering what, what kind of flow rate you have on that well. Um, we've had uh, one major well done and a couple other wells. Um, Mr. Layton could probably give you a better idea of the exact capacity of those wells, so I'll ask uh, Rob to speak. Yeah, so we've done uh, two wells on site that are uh, producing uh, fairly well. Uh, we have to do our 48-hour test, uh, complete a bunch of engineering to get, it, uh, uh, get that completed. Um, so each well is producing 25 to 30 gallons a minute, it appears. And based on our water modeling, we require about 34 gallons a minute for a 24 hour, you know, average daily demand, peak daily demand, I forget the exact wording, but uh, it worked out about 34 gallons a minute where we need to be sustainable. And we look to have, uh, you know, considerably more than that. So um, we're pretty happy with the results of the well wells today. Um, and yeah, any, any other questions I'd be happy to answer. Well, Rob, that's great. Um, the question about, uh, I heard some rumors about a sandy dump. Is that a possibility? Uh, so yeah, so we've got that as part of the campground design. Uh, we want to service about two thirds of the RV park, and you know it's about affordability for some sites. Some people don't want to pay for a fully serviced site. Uh, so town wants to put a sandy dump within the campground. That's great. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I had a question to the proponent. Um, I'm just wondering in your modeling for the the campground. Um, are you, is this, will, will this be a seasonal campground? Um, you know, over what months do you think you'll have most of your, um, your folks? Yeah, so we've specifically written in the zone that uh, it'd be a three months max day. Like our intent is not to have this as, uh, you know, yearly uh, you know, housing specifically. It's, a, it's an RV park. Uh, our intent is for nightly rentals, weekly, you know, weekends, that kind of, uh, that kind of environment. Okay. The reason I ask is we have another item on the agenda that's actually um, looking at potentially opening that up for um, worker housing. And I know I'm putting you on the spot, but is that something you could consider um, for uh, a portion? Uh, our, like I say, our intent is for summer camping. It's more of a motorsports park is what we're trying to build. Uh, we are gonna provide winter, some winter monthly rentals, um, but that would be seasonal. Uh, you know, our intent is to go you know, six months of nightly rentals and then six months of seasonal uh, in, you know, it'd be really, you know, a third to maybe half of the campground for, for those, uh, those seasonal monthly winter rentals. All right. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. So on receipt, all in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. And there's a recommendation. I'll move that. Moved and seconded that, um, sorry, where are we? <laughs> that the CVRD endorsed the agency referral list as outlined in Appendix B, um, and that the CVRD staff consult with First Nations in accordance to the referrals management. And finally, that the CVRD board authorized staff to begin discussions on provisions of community amenities as per Section 72 of the Community Amenity Contribution Bylaw. Any other discussion on that recommendation? Seeing none, all in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. Thank you very much. All right, we're chugging along. So uh, next item is number six, uh, the electoral area C development permit for 8376 Island Highway North. 
Move the report. Moved and seconded. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Jody is here still to uh, provide a summary of this report and answer any of your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair and Directors. Uh, page 11 of your report there will show the site plan of what's being uh, spoken about here. The owners, Chad Seifert and Jill Lamberts, are online there. They can provide some more details. The applicants, they have a small area on the western end of this larger agricultural lot where they can build a residence. Because this end is outside the agricultural land reserve, they can build this as a second house on the lot but that means it's inside the farmland protection development permit area. So these development permits uh, for the purpose, solely for the purposes of protecting adjacent agricultural uses may include requirements for screening, landscaping, fencing, and the siting of buildings. In response to the development permit guidelines, the applicants prepared this landscape plan you see there. The Northern vegetative buffer is to compose of double row of shrubs, the several trees, and the southern side is to be a three meter single row of vegetation. The Air Cultural Advisory Planning Commission reviewed this and supported it as proposed. The Ministry of Air Culture came back with some recommendations regarding the siting the building more towards the middle and achieving five meter vegetative buffers. The draft permit you have there in your report does include this five meter northern buffer but only includes uh, the three meter southern buffer for the purposes of maximizing the air cultural utility of the lot by siting the buildings and driveway closer to the southern side to make way for an orchard and to retain a market garden, which you can't, which is behind that particular map. You can see it on the air photo on page 10. It's on the ALR side. The increased buffer would move the driveway north at the expense of that market, of that established market garden on the ALR side of the lot. So, Madam Chair, uh, staff is recommending that this development permit be issued as described in Appendix B with the seven meter building setback and the three meter uh, buffer on the southern side. Thank you. Thank you. And will, do the proponents have any other comments to add? Uh, no, I just wanted to thank you for your consideration and, and you know, um, we're here to answer any questions you might have about what we're attempting to do on the property. Great, thanks. And do the directors have any questions for either staff or the proponents? Dr. Brief. Thank you, Madam Chair. It looks like one of those long skinny properties that uh, front the uh, St. Lawrence River in Quebec. <laughs> I didn't know they, they can make them that long and skinny. It almost, it almost goes out to the ocean. <laughs> but uh, no, I think um, it, it's a, obviously a challenge with the shape of the property, what you can do with it. And you say it's not in the ALR. The front portion is not. The front portion. The front portion. So it, it, the back portion is, I see. So. So that it makes it makes sense to me. I mean, you have to do what you have to do with what you've got. So um, I think that uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Great, Director Armour. Well, you'll have to indulge me now with the St. Lawrence comments. And uh, I mean, by the way, I'm I'm fine with the application. I'll, I'll be voting, but I <laughs> I have to share that story and for the benefit of the homeowners too. But. The French still scratch their heads as to why the English brought the square kind of properties to, to Canada. And a lot of it, our CEO would agree with the principle behind those long stretchy properties, which, which, which was all about reducing the cost of infrastructure. By having thin lots, it allowed people to build their house on the road, less uh, trouble clearing the snow in the winter, no long driveway. So everybody was fronting the road and everybody was nearby each other could help each other. And then the, the property would typically, the first half of the long stretch would be agriculture and the back stretch would be forestry, right? So there was a purpose to the design and we never understood why the English brought these square boxes which increased the cost at all level uh, around spreading everything around. So 
Um, thanks for raising that as part of this application. You just refreshed my memory on my uh, on my roots. Thank you. Thanks, Director Arbor. Was that part of the Quebec law sensitivity training? <laughs> yes. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, my only comments were, you know, I, I think uh, I really like the design of, of um, the way the, the house has been situated to maximize food production. And, and um, just one question I had to the proponents, are you proposing or do you have a, a market stand for, on the highway? That is part of what that front garage shaped building is going to be. Um, it's not, it, we hadn't gotten as far as planning how the layout of that building was going to be, but one other thing we're exploring as well as um, uh, small commercial kitchen space within that building to allow us to do value add production of, uh, you know, any goods that we take off the property. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks. I think you're going to be in, in very good company. That stretch of Black Creek on the highway has got some great um, farm stands, so I'm all in favor. I don't see any other questions. So on receipt, all in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. And we have a recommendation. recommendation. Moved and seconded that the CVRD approve the farmland protection development permit. And finally, that the corporate legislative officer be authorized to execute the permit. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, um, all in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. And thank you very much. Good luck on their farming year. Um, I'm wondering if we want to take a five minute break um, before we get into the next round of reports. So we'll come back. Well, let's just make it 11.15. Is that okay? Or is that too long? Okay, you can get, grab a cup of tea. So we'll be back at 11.15.
We send a letter to every single property owner. I'll call the meeting back to order. So we have, we're up to item seven on the agenda, the Comox Valley Agricultural Plan update for receipt. Moved. Moved and seconded. And over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Jody McLean is still with us to uh, provide a, a summary of this report and answer any of your questions. Thank you, CCO, Chair and Directors. With regard to reviewing the Comox Valley Air Cultural Plan, the CBRD has budgeted $30,000 to hire a coordinator with experience in air cultural land use in the Comox Valley. This year, the coordinator will be taking on some pre-planning activities, including an assessment of the current air cultural plan, what was achieved, what was not, and the efficacy of those measures that were implemented and building relationships with members uh, and organizations involved in the farming community to put the CVRD in a position to update and modernize the agricultural plan in 2022, 2023. The report you have in front of you uh, explains the Investment Agricultural Foundation's grant program titled the Local Government Partnership Program which may fund work on air cultural plans through matching contributions. Madam Chair, the recommendation in the, the report has a resolution that here that will enable staff to make that grant application. Thank you. Do the directors have any questions or comments? Dr. Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. Of course, you know, outside of our our little review we haven't really visited this for 20 years <laughs> so no one can accuse us of being hasty i'm certainly in support thank you thanks dr Bree. i'm in support as well and very excited to see this coming forward um, many thanks to the Valley food policy council and to staff for you know giving such a robust review of you know what's been happening can I just ask a couple of questions? Did I hear that has a coordinator already been hired or is on the on the books to be hired? Yeah, on the books to be hired. Okay, and what's the, sorry, what's the timing around that? We're looking at, uh, we're looking for people uh, this summer. Okay, fantastic. Um, we do have a food hub project that's happening right now. And I'm wondering if there are any kind of, is there an overlap in that um, process? Can we take advantage of any of that momentum or is this going to be fairly separate from what's happening? There'll be separate uh, projects, but definitely some of the key players will be involved in both. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. And I guess, you know, to be to be fair, I guess, we, I mean, we're, we'll have the, the staff person, but if we, for whatever reason, do not receive the grant um, for for activities coming up in the fall, what do you staff foresee as the the activities that this this person could continue on, or what would happen? I guess if we didn't get the grant. Yeah, so we have uh, uh, budget uh, funds to hire the coordinator. They can proceed with the the review and. Um, and building relationships, but uh, the grant, the, if we don't get a grant, it's maybe less, um, but less work. Yeah. Okay, all right. Did you have a comment, Director Arbor? Uh, good questions, 
uh, Chair Amir, isn't uh, just to plant the seed on the plan B, um, isn't community works funding allowed for planning exercises of this type? I believe from memory that um, other types of planning exercises related to things like that are eligible. So I'd, I'd be curious to see if staff have looked into that. And if not, maybe in thinking about a plan B, if this didn't come through, that we could look at an option like that. I'll just ask um, our CFO, Mariah Fort, to respond to the community works funds. And certainly hearing your comments here, it sounds as though you really want us to have a robust plan B in the event that we're not successful. So we, we're, we're getting that messaging from you. Um, through the chair to Director Arbor, Community Works Funds do support the funding of master plans and overall arching um, plans and killing asset management. So we can take a greater look at this initiative to see if there's alignment. Great, thank you. Um, because I think, you know, it would be such a shame all of the um, sort of the momentum that we have from, from the food plan. We've got sort of the agricultural sector coming together and it would be sad to lose that momentum if we didn't get this funding. So that's kind of what I'm hearing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other comments on the report? So on receipt, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Then that's carried. And we have a recommendation move moved and seconded that the Comox Valley Regional District Board approve submitting an application to the Investment Agriculture Foundation's Local Government Partnership Program for the purposes of updating the Comox Valley Agricultural Plan. And any comments or any other co questions on that recommendation? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. And item number eight, fireworks service review for receipt. Moved and seconded and over to staff. Thank you very much. And Amanda Yasinski is here to present the report and answer any of your questions. Amanda. Good morning to the CAO, to the chair. This report provides an update and overview of the current fireworks service following the direction from this committee February 8th of this year. Specifically, that staff be directed to bring forward a report providing options concerning the further regulation of the discharge and sale of fireworks within electoral areas A, B, and C of the Comox Valley Regional District. And further that, the report include the current regulations and views of each local jurisdiction and authority with the intention of establishing a consistent regulatory approach across the region. This report is for information only while providing an overview of the current service and will also advise of the changes and bylaw amendments that were implemented following the 2017 and 2019 service reviews to the Comox Valley Regional District's Fireworks Regulations Bylaw number 1971. Currently in the CBRD, fireworks are only permitted to be sold in electoral areas A, B, and C from October 24th to November 1st inclusive. A permit is required to be purchased prior to discharging any fireworks at a cost of $10. Permits are available at the CBRD main office and online through a downloadable form. However, at this time, payment for online permits are not available. Majority of permits are sold over Halloween and have been increasing annually. Copies of all fireworks permits sold are shared with the responding fire department, RCMP, and when applicable to CFB Comox. Fireworks under permit are exempt from the CBRD's noise bylaw. Permits to discharge fireworks are available all year. So other than Halloween, when we're super busy, grad ceremonies and Canada Day are the other two um, times throughout the summer historically we've issued permits. However, the CVRD has the discretion to stop permit sales during provincial fire bans. This year, as in previous years, the CVRD will proactively stop the sale of fireworks permits, keeping in line with provincial and local fire bans. This typically occurs from mid-July to early September. On average, the CVRD receives two complaints a year related to fireworks being discharged. In 2020, these complaints made up 1% of the complaints received overall to the Bylaw Enforcement Department. A chart depicting the 2020 Bylaw Enforcement files, including fireworks, is attached as Appendix A of this report. 
Since 2011, and in a series of reports, staff have reviewed and brought forward the following options as potential changes to fireworks regulations in electoral areas. Limit the time of year that fireworks can be discharged. Further limit the time of year that fireworks can be sold. Increase or decrease the cost of the permit to discharge fireworks. Streamline permit approval process and increase the dollar amount for fines for discharging or selling, selling fireworks without a permit. The board directed reviews conducted in 2017 and 2019 resulted in increased advertising on social media, radio, print ads, and the CBRD's website, the dedicated page to fireworks. Additionally, an educational video on fireworks in the CBRD and further contact with fireworks vendor in electoral areas. The recommendations from the 2017 review included an increase in fine amounts to $500, increased vendor participation on education at the point of sale and clarifying the terms of age in the bylaw. These recommendations have all since been implemented. The 2019 review concentrated on an approach to further regulate fireworks in rural areas, specifically the ability to introduce a required permit prior to purchase, there are some difficulties in imposing further requirements for businesses selling fireworks as the CBRD does not have the express ability to regulate businesses or undertake business regulations such as business licenses within the electoral areas. We discovered that there is no ability for the CBRD to require the purchase of a permit prior to the purchase of fireworks. This year, after reviewing the fireworks regulations bylaws from other Comox Valley local governments, Staff has identified potential changes to the Comox Valley Regional District Fireworks Regulations Bylaw Number 1971. These changes would align the CBRD's firework, fireworks bylaw to the surrounding municipalities bylaws. The options identified for consideration are ban the sale of fireworks in the CBRD to be consistent with member municipalities, ban the discharge of fireworks with the exception of public displays put on through permit by community association or fire departments. Ban the discharge of fireworks altogether to be consistent with member municipalities. Continue to allow the discharge of fireworks but reduce permits and discharge to only be available from October 24th to November 1st inclusive as per the Fireworks Act. A comparison chart of the local Fireworks bylaws is attached to this report as Appendix B. And that concludes the report and I can answer any questions. Great, okay, thank you. Do directors have any questions or comments? Director Grief. Thanks, Madam Chair. Of course, um, no matter what you do, you really can't control people getting uh, their hands on fireworks. They'll, they'll manage to get them anyway. So you kind of have to go with the flow. Um, I obviously think that the very best way forward would be for the community halls and associations and the fire departments to do, you know, community. But uh, where I live uh, on Rennie Road, we have about 32 residents on a big cul-de-sac, I guess. And, and uh, that's pretty well what they do. They're not really an association officially, but... Uh, you know, very few people set them off on their own property. They usually take them down to one particular spot. <laughs> so, you know, I think uh, it, it, it's a fine line. I, I know there's there's been some bad behavior by certain individuals, and there always will be. But I think if you look at Comox and Courtney, they they have illegal discharging of, fire, of, uh, of fireworks as well, even though they don't they ban the actual uh, selling of them. So um, it, it's a hard one. Uh, as you say, we do get a couple of complaints a year. And I know that almost everybody's had a, a, a pet of some sort react to discharge firearms. I used to have one dog that would disappear and she'd turn up in the basement under the couch, you know. So it's a real tough one, but you know, you, I think, again, like all these issues, education is a really big piece of it. So. As long as we have a messaging going out, and I, like I say, we encourage the uh, the, the local associations, local neighborhoods to uh, to get a permit and and uh, and uh, work together rather than individually. So, no easy answers. Thanks. Thanks, Director Grief. 
Um, I had a couple of comments and questions. I know I personally received more than two, um, you know, complaints over Halloween, and I know it's not going through the official channels, so it's hard for staff to sort of see those. And I'm sure Dr. Grieve gets those emails as well. Um, and at the same time, I don't think any increasing fines and um, costs. I'm not sure if that's really the answer. Um, I noted one level of government that wasn't kind of considered in the fireworks regulations chart was KFN. So I'm wondering if staff are able to bring this up with KFN around um, sort of just the regulations and restrictions. Is that something that's possible? Uh, Amanda, do you want to uh, talk about what may have been done in the past or what we know? And uh, I, I can then speak to the options of uh, a discussion with KFN in the future. Thank you. So to answer your question, um, we did reach out to KFN and, and they responded and would like to participate in a conversation, but had some steps they wanted to go through first in their own process around fireworks. So I, I left them, I didn't include them in the comparison chart because I didn't want to, I, there, we need more clarity um, and I thought it best to wait um, before we hear it directly and have that can have that conversation. Uh, we know that they allow um, are not regulating the sale, but I don't know what their intent is with mm -hmm. that yet. So they were left off the comparison, but that is the reason I didn't want to put down something that was incorrect okay. or not where they're going. And Madam Chair, I might suggest that we have monthly meetings with KFN to talk about subjects of mutual interest. We could uh, ask to include this on the agenda and it may be once they get their own stats together that that conversation take place. But if the, this committee would like that, they could resolve to, to direct us to organize that for you. Okay. I know that's a resolution I'd, I'd like to make. Um, I noticed Cumberland seems to be a bit of a wild west in terms of not having an age restriction. <laughs> or, I don't know if this has been brought up to them as a government to government or if that's something that the, the directors would be interested in. Um, it's difficult, as Director Grieve said, you know, if if one community um, allows the sale and does it restrict and the rest do, um, yeah, I'm just wondering if there's other, if we can reach out to the other communities, if they've seen this chart, maybe. Uh, I've seen, okay, they do ban the sale, so that's probably um, better, but uh, I guess I was wondering if a conversation between you know, governments or between staff around fireworks works was was of interest. Um, I'm thinking about the recommendations that staff have made around further regulation, and I'm also just contemplating the comment Director Grieve made at Rennie Road. If we limited the number of permits and had this done as a community and, and had it so that it was quite clear, the people who are who are setting off fireworks actually have the permits because I don't think just selling more and more permits I think makes it really difficult then to regulate who has a permit and who doesn't it doesn't make sense to just continually sell more permits if we're getting more and more complaints from the community or at least you know those of us who are um I personally would love to see more of those community events so it be at fire you know if our um fire stations are interested in putting a fundraiser together as a you know and that so that people know that this is happening in their community and can take actions for their animals i mean that's really the big issue is is the impact that these fireworks are having on um animals in the community and i mean i did receive an email from a constituent near who's in the comox area who's a vet and who gets triggered by fireworks going off so Let's just also bring that to the attention of folks that they might not even realize how those types of noises can impact individuals. Um, so around around regulation of the um, the number of permits, yeah, have have staff thought about that idea? We have spent considerable time and resources um, educating the public and advertising that they are required to have a permit. Yeah. So for bylaws point of view and the previous work done, um, this report did not cover increasing fines or permits. We've already done that. We've already increased fines. So that, that, that's been done. Um, 
if we stop, like if we say we're only going to issue 30 permits, people are still going to set them off. They're going to come down here for their permit because they already come down here for Comox and Cumberland and Courtney and we have to send them away. They've already bought their fireworks. So they're going to set them off anyway. So the permit, mm -hmm. we're up to 78, I believe, last year. That's a small, small, small percentage of actually how many fireworks are going off. And I just want to remind the committee as well, KFN has one possible retailer. We have up to eight in a year. So if someone's setting off fireworks in Comox or Courtney or even Cumberland, they're purchasing them without a doubt within our area. Mm. So limiting the people who come in to do the right thing for that $10 permit, they're the families that, you know, the groups in Rennie Road or wherever, they're not necessarily the, the problem properties. It's the ones that don't have the permit or the calls that we get from Comox. So I just want, like the sale for us is, is where people are requiring their fireworks. Um, and I did talk to, to staff um, at each local government when we did this and I got their bylaws pulled and went through it with them. So there is no changes on the horizon or, or, or proposed changes for other municipalities in our area, um, other than maybe KFN with their approach to fireworks, as I understand. Okay. Well, it's been discussed quite extensively, extensively over the last couple of years here anyways. I don't know if directors have any other comments. No. Hearing none, on receipt. Um, all in favor of receipt of the report. And that is carried. And um, in terms of there, there wasn't a recommendation, but if I could ask a motion to staff to come back to us with a report um, just regarding the conversation with KFN and, and what arises in terms of their the direction that they're going. Would anyone like to second? All right. Oh, we can add Cumberland if you want. Okay, but it still has to be seconded. Does anyone? All right, that's not the flavor today, I guess. So we'll move on. Thanks, everybody. Um, number nine, Union Bay Improvement District conversion update for receipt. I'll move that. Moved. Seconded, thank you. So we can discuss and over to staff. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and Directors. And James Warren is here to provide this report and answer any of your questions. Thanks, Russell, and good morning, Directors. So just a brief uh, update on the staff report that's in front of you. The, as you know, the uh, Union Bay Improvement District hosted a referendum in November of 2020 to consider conversion to regional district services. That referendum, uh, it, it passed. And as such, we've been working towards a conversion. It will take a place on July 1st, 2021, the order and council has since been issued by the province. And so, um, so all of those pieces are in place. There's been extensive effort on, on, on both sides of the table with UBID uh, staff, chair and trustees, as well as at the CVRD. Uh, we have seven sub teams that have been working through the, the variety of conversion activities. And I can't say enough about the efforts that the staff are making and, and picking up the different, uh, different components, everything from records management to the water operations to the personnel and HR that is impacting uh, on a conversion. And so um, you can see in the staff report, Appendix A is a, a very brief update on the uh, on the various activities related to conversion. Uh, and happy to go into any more detail if you've got questions on any of those. One of the topic areas that's probably most relevant is the communications. And we do have an open house scheduled next Tuesday uh, at 4.30. It's, uh, it's online, unfortunately. We'd love to be in person, but, um, but we can't right now. So we are hosting an online event, uh, encouraging members of the public to sign up for that. And we'll be going over some of the, some of the highlights of conversion and what the public can expect in terms of um, the, the seamless transition of services from UBIT to the CVRD. Uh, the staff report here has two recommendations in it. One is to advance service establishment bylaws for the for the three services: water, fire, um, water supply and distribution, fire protection, and then street lighting. And so we would recommend that you uh, implement or initiate the the establishment of those bylaws. They don't have to be done before July first. They can be done in the months to follow. But we wanted to get this on the books for for some action to undertake. 
And then secondly, uh, there's been a working group that's been providing advice to the conversion process for the past, um, uh, probably for the past eight or 10 months or more even, when we were looking at the conversion study itself. We would like that working group, we're recommending that it continue for three months beyond the conversion date. And, uh, and that, that working group is made up of uh, the elected officials representing UBID, Director Arbor, and, um, and a couple of staff members to, to solicit input and advice, um, gain some local knowledge, and to share the, share the different efforts that are going on. So, uh, so staff are recommending that that continue on for three months. And if need be, we would, we would come back in August or September if there's an interest in continuing, continuing on further. Um, so available for any questions that you might have. Thank you. And it looks like Director Arbor's got a question. Yeah, thanks. I, I mostly have comments. Um, James is right. It's been actually in the works for quite a long time, starting I think in December 2019 is when the Board of CBRD agreed to uh, start looking at a governance study. I think I got my date right on that. And then we established a, the group the, that started just around the governance study in um, a little over a year ago, which um, really allowed us to look at all the services um, in a fairly in-depth manner leading up to the referendum in November. And that group moved from being a governance study group to a conversion study group. And the ministry has been partaking in all the meetings as well of that group. Um, the last few months, I think, yeah, kudos to both um, CVRD and, and UBID staff. It has been noticed by all of us elected officials how much work is going into the transition and uh, and i think we've both been we've all been impressed by uh, by the work performed um i'm definitely in favor of the recommendations of, of both recommendations um, i think when we get past july i'm sure the asc table will see a few reports come over the coming year um, as as we start managing the assets the public assets um, you can expect, for example, um, there's work being initiated between UBIT staff and, and CVRD staff around a water master plan. Um, still a lot of consideration given to the, the fire service and, uh, and their, their hopes around both uh, the fire truck, which might be more near term, and, and, uh, and a fire hall uh, down the road. But uh, I just want to talk about the quality of the process, and, and I really want to take Thank uh, James and the UBIT trustees and their current uh, CEO over there for really, um, yeah, really dedicating themselves um, to a, a really good transition. I'm, I'm hoping the CVRD board will be quite impressed by the time some of those pieces start landing at, at that level. And, and for you guys, will be more uh, in the roll up sleeve, I think, past July around um, just some of the options around the future service delivery. So thank you so much, James, for all your work. Degree. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, the fire department transition of fire services. Um, obviously, they have an old hall. Now, part of the MDA with uh, uh, Union Bay Properties or whatever was the fact they were going to donate land. Is that correct? I mean, you, either one of you, I'm sure, are up on this. But I'm just wondering, um, is, is there already a site for the new hall picked out? I, so I believe, so, so when the conversion happens, the, uh, the agreements that Union, Union Bay Improvement District has with developers, property owners, they will become our agreements. Uh -huh. We'll inherit those, those documents. And so I believe that there is land identified through that MDA with Union Bay Estates. And I, I would have to confirm the status of the, the property in question. So, Director Arby, have something yet? I, I would just uh, make a small correction. They do have a hall. It's just it's a, it's very old and on, on yeah. a very small piece of property. Um, and definitely, I, I'm on the record talking about how important it is to look at the, a new fire hall. For, but in the context of the broader fire services, 
um, for the whole South area. So I know the fire chiefs and everybody have already initiated discussion on that. And the fire chief of Union Bay is, is in a working group, I, I believe, with, uh, um, with CVRD. So you are correct that those issues will be brought forward, I'm sure, at our table as, as, we, uh, as we head into the next number of months. And, yep. um, and looking at options, you know, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what we'll be doing. But I also believe that the, the old building is, uh, in my opinion, not, uh, you know, professional opinion is, is, I think people in Union Bay knows that uh, it's probably coming near the end of its uh, lifetime. They identified in 1999, I think that it needed to be replaced. Thank you. Good to know. Uh, Director Grieve, you have any follow-up? Well, just at, uh, at my, my time at FCM, we tried to uh, uh, bring it to the, the federal government's attention that the community works funds are, are uh, excluded fire departments. And my understanding is that's still the case. So I just, um, I mean, I don't know. They seem to run a brick wall on that one for the last 20 years. So where, where do we look for fire halls? I mean, we, we've got one going ahead on, in Merville and possibly Mount Washington, but it's a long slog and it, you have to pretty well you know, do it all through borrowing, pay as you go, establish the service area, and everybody pays their requisition. But um, is there any 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 light at the end of the tunnel? Any possibility of other grant funding opportunities? I think there was something to the restart program, but it was limited to apparatus or something. Just I know I know James Bass isn't here; he'd have it on the tip of his fingers, but. Turn it over to staff. Yeah, Madam Chair, what I would say is it's very early stages uh, uh, for the uh, design and development of the new hall. And by the time that hits the, the bricks hit the, the uh, mortar, there may be changes to, to funding or otherwise. So very early stages yet. We definitely are aware of the challenges to the community with respect to expenses, not only of a new fire hall, but other services. So we will be looking at under every rock for available funding and your lobbying at FCM may have taken uh, fruit and uh, provided us an opportunity by the time it comes to building it. And of course, the very fact that we're not an improvement district wants to be part, become part of local government, then we have the options of boring at MFA at extremely competitive rates as well. So, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can win the hearts and minds of the, uh, the citizenry in, in Union Bay and, and, and bring some deliverables forward. Uh, with this conversion, so. Okay, thank you. Dr. Arbor, do you have a comment? From a, from a macro perspective, there's no doubt. And first of all, it, it, Union B is one of the, I think, core concerns of the regional district being a settlement node. And I think it, we're already without the Union B Improvement District involved in a lot of uh, very challenging, but also rewarding files once we do figure it out, figure them out. My message would be, um, our approach will be looking at all the different services and trying to maximize grants where they can and where they cannot look at borrowing and other things. Because at the end of the, the day, the rate payers of Union Bay get one tax bill. And I think it's our job. If, if we can't get a grant here, then let's push for one in, in this other service and things like that. But we're, we're trying to do asset management across the board and trying to um, make sure that uh, they're they're their infrastructure is sustainable over time. So that's definitely the commitment going into it. And I think adding those three pieces, those three services will give us a more comprehensive approach as well as CVRD around how we manage all the, the, the different uh, services that exist for the community. Thank you. I had a question to staff regarding um, the, the funding that we received from the province to help with the, the governance and the conversion. It seemed very small compared to how much time and effort that you're putting into it. And um, are you aware is is the province open to um, providing more funding? Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, so the twenty five thousand dollars noted in the report is uh, is at the high end of the grant funding that is awarded for improvement district conversions. Um, for the more complex ones, larger ones, twenty five thousand is typically what what the ministry would commit. <clears throat> We have identified uh, other needs, or including some of the water water master planning, um, and and just more analysis around the existing infrastructure, as as a, a big piece of the um, assessment work, so that we understand the system better. Uh, and so we've been in communication with the province. We are we are trying to identify other grant opportunities. 
um, recognizing that uh, the the I think the province's perspective is that the ratepayers for the service areas are typically responsible across the province for these 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 types of conversions and these activities, and so we're trying we're trying to identify additional funding uh, availability, and we'll we'll carry on doing that uh, doing that effort. Great, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, on receipt. All in favor? Any opposed? And that's carried. And we have a couple of recommendations. That the staff bring forward the service establishment bylaw for the Union Bay Water Service, Union Bay Fire Protection Service, and Union Bay Street Lighting Service for first and second, first, second, and third readings. And for that the board authorize participating area approval for electoral area A to be given by the direct area, electoral area director consenting in writing to adoption of such service establishment bylaws in accordance with section 347 of the Local Government Act. Any comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. Moved, Moved and seconded that the board support the continuation of the advisory body known as the Union Bay Improvement District Working Group. And for that the working group meet as required until September 30th, 2021. Comments? Seeing none, uh, all in favor? Any opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. And moving on to item number 10, the community halls outdoor washing, washroom funding requests for receipt. Good. Moved and seconded and over to. Thank you very much. And Doug DeMarso is on the line to present this report and answer any of your questions. Over to Doug. Thank you through the chair of directors. Um, this is follow up on the community hall service as well as the outdoor washroom service, which we were directed to target to wind down. So as such, we reached out to the community halls to determine if there was any um, interest in providing outdoor washroom services. We received three responses for a total of 64,000, uh, one being from Black Creek, Merville, and Union Bay Community Clubs. So moving forth, we're recommending that 36,000 from the Comfort Station Service be established to support these three community halls and that we look to the restart funding, which will be presented in the next report to potentially make up the difference. Uh, if that's not supported, we'll uh, undertake a formula to do a proportional uh, grant each of the calls uh, to cover the original 36,000 ask. And uh, the remaining funding will have to be sorted out in another fashion. So uh, just a quick note is that throughout the process, we're very clear to the community halls that these outdoor washrooms are to be maintained in the future by the community halls and this funding is just for capital only. I think there's some good conversations had with many of the halls around this and three have decided to move forward. I'll take any questions. Thanks, Doug. Looks like Director Grieve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through the, the Chair and the CAO to staff, um, Doug, are we planning on actually rescinding that uh, that service, or are we just going to leave it on mothballs in case we need to revive it at a later date? Um, I think it's planned on being rescinded, but that might be a question for ledge services. Perhaps I can defer to them. Yeah, because I'd be uh, I'd be in favor of just putting it on mothballs because we don't know what's coming. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. I'll just ask Pete Martins if he has any comment on the options of uh, mothballing or rescinding. Thanks, Justin, through the chair. Uh, yeah, no, no major um, recommendation regarding whether uh, the action the board wishes to take respecting this. Um, certainly, uh, we're mindful, and, and as we go through our budget processes each year, uh, we look at each service, and, and as part of that, we can we can certainly take action and bring forward recommendations to the board to to address anything that might be outstanding. Okay, thank you. Just further, then, it is um, it it is a service of the entire electoral area, correct? A, B, and C. No, it excludes Denman and Ormby. Oh, it does, yeah, okay. Portion of being sound, yeah. Because, uh, you know, really those kind of bylaws are hard fought. Thank you. I had a question for st staff regarding the um, the construction. 
was were there any discussions regarding um, the capacity of septic fields to be able to take on a, another washroom? Yes, um, each, well, so in particularly with um, both Union Bay and Merville, there was discussions around the septic fields and part of this funding identifies confirmation of that. So if the confirmation recognizes that it's not uh, an ability to take on, they'll have to uh, explore alternative options. So it might just be a simple pump out and a much simpler outhouse like Black Creek's putting in, or they might decide to withdraw their application. But they didn't want to spend the money up front without knowing if there was funding involved. So it's, it's in the consideration process after, after this. My only other comment was just in, in like a overall general comment about like outdoor washrooms um, on halls that tend to not be um, monitored or at least, you know, have staff on site um, during the day and in, definitely not at night, just the, the potential for vandalism and other activities that can happen with an out building. Um, was that discussed at all of how security would be handled around outbuildings? Are these buildings going to be attached to the, the halls or they're separate? Yeah, so all, all of them have a little different model. So the Maryville Hall, it will be, is projected to be slightly separate in amongst those three, the two other outbuildings in there closer to the gardening space. Union Bay will be attached to the hall with an outside entrance and Black Creek will just be your typical kind of parks outhouse. So all of them have, you know, we're very clear, which is why you know, many of them didn't jump on because we discussed all of those issues in our collaboration meetings with the community halls. And each one of these three thought that they could manage that through uh, either a lock approach or, or leaving them open and see how it goes and then consider locking them in the future on, on different hours. But, um, you know, they all hold multiple outdoor events there and they all are, are aware of those. So in the design, we, we asked them to be very specific with anyone they were looking into design that, you know, they're looking at stainless steel, if, if indeed they're even putting in sinks and stuff like that. So it's very, um, very minimal and hopefully, you know, as strong and durable as can be. Sure. And they all, these three communities yeah. felt it was still something they want to go forward with. Yeah. And, and, you know, knowing some of the events that do happen around the halls in the future, when we come back to having folding events, um, having outdoor washrooms like that, I think would be really beneficial just for comfort of all of those attendees. Um, but I just worry about the ability to maintain and, and um, keep those going through the non event times, but it sounds like you've had those discussions. Yeah, I can just comment additionally, you know, we're, we're not, we don't actually see a lot of vandalism in our, in our outhouses. We're fortunate in that way. You know, it's perceived that there has been, but it's, it actually goes pretty good. And we've also offered, uh, you know, if they're looking at different cleaning services to discuss that of putting them on the loop with our parks contractors, but paying for it separately. So okay. we've offered a lot of different approaches. So yeah, okay. thank you for your concerns. Great, good to know. I don't see any other questions. So on receipt, is it all in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. And there's a recommendation. Move it. That an all allocation of 36,000 from the comfort station service function 686 be committed to distribution to assist the Black Creek Community Center, Verbal Community Hall, and the Union Bay Community Club for the construction of outdoor washrooms. Any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. Uh, item number 11, BC Safe Start Restart, Safe Restart Grant Program Funding Second Installment for receipt. Moved, moved and seconded and over to staff. Thank you very much. And Doug DeMars so will present this report and answer your questions too. Uh, thank you through the chair to directors. This is, as you noted, the second installment of the BC a restart funding. The first installment was for about 723,000 and much of it has been distributed. The second installment is for 402,000. And the recommendations of this report really intend to invest in rural areas for long-term benefits. They act on the most urgent needs and respond to the real needs, but not exclusively, and support service delivered by both the CVRD and volunteers. Should also acknowledge that uh, anecdotally, we do feel that a lot of this grant funding 
has come forward with with the directors and rural area director support around the province looking at uh, more options through their advocacy and that's great. Um, as we move ahead, we'll look at providing this funding specifically to uh, community halls, Seal Bay, in this instance, neighborhood preparedness programs, and potentially the fire hall support. So starting with community halls, uh, as I alluded to in the last report, the outdoor washroom requests were not fully funded. So there's potential there for 30,000 to be distributed from here to provide additional support to that. But also, we'll, depending on uh, the outcome of this meeting, we'll look at additional requests that have come from community halls in the past, as well as in the future that may consider upgrades to HVAC, ventilation to help support that air quality. Um, this is all pandemic related as in getting better circulation and ventilation, either for this pandemic or future uh, concerns. And, and lastly, some of the money can also be used by community halls as we're starting to surpass the one year uh, mark that many of them have been closed and they still have some fixed costs. If they still see revenue shortfalls being you know, detrimental to restarting either later this year or in 2022, um, some of that funding may be able to address those shortfalls too. So just noting with all four of them, you know, we're, we're not just looking at the 2021 year here, we're also looking at potentially moving some of this funding into 2022. If that's the case, you'd probably see it again appear in the budget process again. Uh, neighborhood Emergency Preparedness Programs is looking at rural support to support the existing programs and perhaps create new ones where required. Um, some This is envisioned with some additional part-time staffing as a dedicated resource and also potentially some procurement of uh, you know, minor capital items to support that resilience to disasters, either by you know, preparing a neighborhood response plan or, and also utilizing um, some CBRD or this grants resources for if there's a procurement of anything that helps those neighborhoods moving forward in that resilience. Seal Bay Park, last, well, not lastly, but we, we are aware that our parks have seen a huge increase in use. Uh, they were already trending on a huge increase in use prior to this pandemic and it uh, exponentially, exponentially shot forward. Um, it should note that you know one of the groups is people with mobility challenges you know do have limited opportunities to get out into our rural parks and just have had limited opportunities with the you know closing of our community centers and our recreation centers and the limited openings provided by the indoor spaces so you know looking ahead um, creating those spaces for accessibility is important in our community and uh, the seal bay one was projected to be created as we looked uh, to this a number of years ago where we could create more accessible spaces such as you know the new spit and saratoga beaches and nymph falls and now seal bay so we're looking instead of using the community works funds that were previously approved for this project to now shift that to the restart value of two hundred fifty thousand for seal bay and then lastly, any remaining funds could be used for uh, supporting the rural fire halls. Um, this would just be a direct benefit to the taxpayers. So here's our proposed recommendations, completely open to conversation and ideas, and um, I welcome any questions at this point. Thanks, Doug. And Director Arbor has a comment or question. Thanks for the report, Doug. Um, and just, uh, just to head it off, um, yeah, I think that was good in the, your last report when you talked about matching some of these funds into uh, the halls project. Um, that sounds good. And I, I do want to say um, sometimes you have to sing your own praises, but Director Grieve and I were indeed part of a group of five or ten rural area directors that pushed really hard for the province to look at the distribution of restart funds, feeling that there had been some inequity um, the distribution heavily favoring municipalities and not following uh, what we see with community works funds, which tends can be uh, more population based in number of people. And that was true across the province. So it was good to see the province respond. It's interesting to me, they call it a second installment. I don't think they had any plans for having two installments. Um, I think this was a way to rectify what they themselves recognize was a shortcoming in their formula and policy. So that needs to be said, uh, at least internally for ourselves to know. I would, um, I would like to say that um, in the principles that we pushed for, I would like it to be also reflected at the regional district 
in, internally. Um, 250,000 out of the 400 for Seal Bay Park. You know, when I thought about it, I'm thinking we have similar population, 130, 130, 130. The funds we're talking about are not small funds. They are they are more than, than all the time we distribute, the time we take into looking at grant and aid and all these different things. I also need to recognize the need to look at some of our core services. But um, so I'm glad that Doug said, you know, open for ideas. I personally would like to see the kind of things that Cumberland did, something that is very tangible to every one of, of my community of our communities. Um, you know, when they I, I, I dug up what they did for um, their courts, for example, they just redid their their tennis and pickleball. They added pickleball courts and redid the basketball court. Those three things was at a cost of sixty two thousand bucks to them. That's really good value. And we're sitting on an outdoor court study that uh, came to the recreation a year ago. And I know for a fact that, uh, you know, there's there's many places, Hornby, Denman, uh, Fallen Alders, different places where that recreation, outdoor recreation directly linked to the health of people and, and getting back out there. Mm -hmm. We saw the positive impact in Cumberland. And so I'm, I'm thinking of, of maybe smaller projects rather than just, uh, bigger projects that really um, help people. And I, and I can't say that I have all the, the answers today, um, but I do realize that those funds is also our last conversation to the rest of our term. <laughs> you know, when I'm thinking about what do we, what, what box do we want to tick to uh, 20 and 22 and, and showing value to our communities. Um, so I, I, at the end of the day, maybe for today, that those are just examples of, of additional ideas that could come forward and, and maybe would require staff diligence. But for today would be, by when do we need to make decisions around these funds? You know, do we have, do projects have to be completed by March 2022? Or what does it look like? And uh, and I realize for staff, that's probably all. Oh, no, we don't want another huge process to to read through a number of projects. But I think with a little bit of consultation, Doug already has a post. I'll give you another example. Sorry, while I'm talking, but I just got an email on Denman because I consulted a little bit, and I know they have shortfalls due to construction costs around the covered space that we're already funding with the province and things like that. So there may be other things that we want to make sure don't fall through the crack and don't get delayed um, uh, due, due to those higher construction costs. So I'm just wondering some, uh, some feedback from fellow directors. First of all, um, it's, a lot easy, it's a lot easier, to, I think, to sign 250,000 to Sylvia Park. <laughs> I'm sure the chair would enjoy that. But, uh, but again, the core argument we, we made to the province around these funds was parity and equity so that residents across British Columbia see differences in their neighborhoods in, in both the services and also new little things. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Director Arbor. I'll let um, Doug answer the question around um, when does the money have to be spent? And then I'll comment around Seal Bay, if that's okay. Yeah, that's a good question. I might flip that to the our CFA, Mariah, but I don't know if she'll know the answer either. As we, we were under the impression I'd be spent by December this year, but new information has said it's kind of ongoing. So depends on the financial reporting process. I'm not sure if she's received an update on in the interim, but maybe um, Mariah, if you have anything more to add. Um, through the chair, Doug, I, I did take a look at the update and um, there's no time limit for the funds. They essentially are for COVID and post recovery. So they've sort of indicated to us there's no time limit and they're looking at 2020, 2021, but they also have sort of an into 2022. So there's openness and flexibility in that. Okay. I think they're seeing there's going to be long lasting impacts with COVID. So we do have a bit of flexibility sure. um, to ensure we maximize the funding. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much. That certainly makes my next comment a little bit easier. Um, you know, when Doug, when I saw the the where the money was going to be spent, as much as I would love to see, you know, Seal Bay Park in my own backyard being upgraded, it didn't actually sit well with me because I saw that the funding was already there through Community Works, that this was going to be just moved up a little bit. And, you know, when you get money like this that doesn't have strings attached, um, it's not often that you get this kind of money. Um, 
And I thought, you know, we could come up with some other ideas of, of where to better spend the money on a project that doesn't have either funding from another um, option, the way that community works is available for Seal Bay Park. Um, and or to look at some of our previously funded items and just see if, if there was any top ups that were needed. It's a big chunk of money. And so that, yeah, that didn't. So I hope that helps <laughs> Director Arbor. It, 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 as much as I wanted to see it, and I'll come into area B. Um, I was looking particularly at the neighborhood emergency preparedness program that I, which, you know, I've also been really supportive of exp expanding the number of neighborhoods that have that kind of community preparedness. I would be also very interested in seeing more funding go to that um, out of the 250 um, and potentially uh, other items. Um, you know, I'd be open to the ones that uh, Director Arbor has mentioned. I'm also noticing, and I don't know if there are other directors are, um, with the upcoming closure of the Connect um, Center in Courtney, I don't know if folks have noticed an uh, increasing number of encampments starting to get up again, which I think does impact the rural areas. And as much as I know this money is you know, really meant to be specifically for rural areas, um, we may want to consider um, directing some more funding towards homelessness because people do tend to camp out in like off of Marsden and in, in the forested areas. So um, yeah, I would, I personally would prefer to see the money spent there, you know, in a way, because where else does money like that come from to, to serve that community? Um, so those, those are just my comments. Director Grieve, did you have any? Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Doug. Um, yeah, I'm very heartened to see that we're actually going to retain some of this money in the rural areas this time. Uh, we went through 723K, out of which uh, we got a bit of chunk change back. We had 24K for halls and 40K for fire. So this is an opportunity to actually put the money, uh, keep the money in uh, electoral areas. Um, for me, I think uh, go back to fire halls um, because of the fact there's such limited uh, opportunities for any kind of grant funding. Uh, public safety is number one. I'm looking at stuff that would bring real tangible benefits to, to the neighborhoods. And, and I think the Fire Smart Program, Neighborhood Preparedness, all that stuff, it's just gold. Um, the, the fire halls, obviously, this is just a drop in the bucket when it comes to, uh, in the fire bucket, that is, when it comes to fire halls because of the immense cost of, of, of the, uh, the apparatus and, and the trucks and what have you. But, you know, um, I think if we can, for my my feeling, if we can actually have some stuff that's going to outlast um, the, the the current pandemic, current era we're in, and and uh, bring bring neighborhoods together somehow. I think you know I've been pushing for more of the fire smart stuff for a long time. We have we have uh, some of those uh, no escape route. Uh, communities where they're, you know, their backs are to the mountain or, or, or to the forest and there's no way to get out. So, I mean, we have a, a fire smart community up on Martin Park Drive, as you probably know. And I think that's the only one so far in the, in the valley. So, I mean, I, I see, because it, it is, it is a, a considerable sum and it's not going to be repeated. So, uh, uh, my, my vote would be to go for stuff that, that uh, enlists the, the public um, is, uh, uh, you know, about public safety and, and, and fire safety and, and, and uh, neighborhood preparedness. So that's where I, I would want to see the money going, even though I'm always on about community halls. I think that, you know, they're part of the community, obviously, but um, I think, you know, whatever's going to bring us benefit uh, during whatever next crisis we're going to face, and, and it may be an earthquake, it may be fire, a lot of things we don't know. Maybe, maybe a whole bunch of enriched uranium. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Grieve. I'll call the question on receipt. Uh, all in favor of receipt? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. I'm hearing maybe a, a, a refer back to staff motion. Director Arbor. Mm, I'm trying to think about how to proceed because um, 
that consultation, if we're going to ask, obviously there's the recommendation on the board, uh, but if we're going to ask to take the kind of approach that three of us has, take, has talked about, I think there's, there's a need for some kind of consultation channel between staff and the directors. And it feels like we're not in a rush to do it. We also don't want to waste time. Um, but my recommendation would tend to talk about how, you know, not doing as extensive as a process as Grant and not putting a call out, but, but doing some consultation around the best use. Because I want to echo a couple of things uh, because we just got the three of us have talked. Totally agree, neighborhood, so that it benefits the greatest amount of people aligned with our strategic, those are all in the staff report, aligned with our strategic priorities. So the community partnership, I'm still not scared to put money at arm's length outside of our services with nonprofits that turn it into more. Um, climate change. So yeah, not everybody thought driving to Seal Bay and instead improving the amenities in their own neighborhoods. And the one that I care about uh, a little bit outside of strategic priorities, but I think that the pandemic has really brought forward is really stuff that addresses the mental health of people and get them back active and confident into the world. It's been such a hard time for all of us and things that you can do. That's how I ended up in the courts. And the, you know, I'm probably gonna bring at recreation um, some of those ideas. I, I read the participation uh, report for last year for, out of uh, Toronto and heading into the pandemic, we already, already have the lowest level of ch children physical activity in history, right? With, with the screens and all that. And it just, that ties to mental health and later can lead into drive, you know, all these different things. So I, I want projects that even though they won't be a lot of money, that in your immediate neighborhood, there's something to do. You've got a light climate footprint. You've got something that I, I love what they, again, that's my key example. I love what they did in Cumberland with their little refresh of the, the courts and get people back out there being able to walk to, to an enhanced park. I think that's wonderful and do some physical activity. So that's that's my thought. So maybe the recommendation that going back to that then would just be to develop a process uh, basically for us for uh, consulting with elected official to to gather up, you know, uh, more refined ideas around how we could distribute those funds. That CEO may, that might be too broad or <laughs> too, uh, but I, I look forward to stuff and put Doug as well. Well, Madam Chair, I think we've heard some really good input from you to come back with options for you that uh, that address these concerns for, for sure. I leave it up to us to come back with a report given that we have time. And that second report may not quite be it. You can refine it or otherwise, but let's uh, let's do this right. And I'll ask Doug even to reach out to each, each of you as we're developing the report to make sure we've got it right. Thank you. Madam Chair, if it, if it is possible, it might gain the benefit of the uh, former report if, if you did consider the 35,000 uh, to be for the community hall or support for washroom buildings as the pandemic is still ongoing and the outdoor spaces will likely be the first events we will see. Thank you very much, Doug. Yeah, so if we could have that commitment and then the rest of the funds are subject to this further consideration. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to move the, the 35,000 for washrooms to match the, uh, I think what was the other 64, fund? 64,000. Is that, is that right, Doug? Yeah, 64 total of which I think 36 was put in from the uh, 686 comfort station. So the remainder would be potentially 30, but it'd be nice to have the buffer. So the 35, sorry, 35, 34, 35,000 35, would be good, yeah. Yeah, 35,000 from restart fund. So I'll move that first and then and further that staff uh, engages or whatever Russell said, <laughs> that was good, that there'll be consultation and we'll take our time and, and uh, for the remainder of the money. Yeah. Uh, Director Freed. Thank you. My, uh, my question uh, through to Doug would be, uh, you know, with the incredible cost of building materials right now, uh, should we leave a little bit more of a cushion on that? Should we make it 40? We don't have to spend it all. Yeah, I did put some of that into the uh, equations, but you're right. Um, it's not going to hurt because it just comes back to the revenue fund here. So if you wanted to make it 40, I'm sure it'd be appreciated by all, all organizations that were maybe not so tight. Okay. So Director Arbor is okay with that? With friendly amendment? The friendly, yes. Okay. So it's been moved and second, seconded. Thank you. All right. And any other comments on that recommendation? 
Lisa, are you okay with the wording or? Yeah, it's 40. Yes, at the end it, it turned to 40. And that staff refer, uh, come back to us with a report um, regarding some of the items that have been discussed around the table in terms of criteria. Great. Any other comments on that recommendation? Seeing none, um, all those in favor? Any opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. Well, I'm glad that went the way that it did. So, number item number 12 the summary of rationale for multifamily water rates for receipt. Moved and seconded, and over to staff. Thank you very much. And Chris LaRose is on the line to uh, provide a summary of this report uh, for your consideration. Over to Chris. Thank you, Russell, and through the chair. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, so this brief report was developed to introduce and respond to a letter received from a water local service area water system user, Diane Simpson. She was questioning the current practice of billing for two dwellings when a secondary suite is added. So in her letter, Diane appealed to the water committee, but as Diane lives in the Comox Valley Water Local Service Area, function 305, Stafford brought the letter through the EASC. So in response to the letter, we've, we've touched on several points in the report. The first being that the rate is based on, the rate is developed and, and based on the average consumption for each sector and you know, necessarily takes the middle road. So the result is, is that some residences don't use their allotment under the flat rate and that others find their allotment inadequate. And it's not all bad news. Um, as, as this resident and others in a similar position are, are paying twice a slightly lower multifamily rate than twice the full single family rate. And there may be some consolation in knowing that uh, both Courtney and Comox follow a similar approach when dealing with secondary suites. So I definitely sympathize with the property owner, but uh, we believe in this situation, the multifamily rate is appropriate for this application. So we're happy to answer any questions on the topic. Thanks, Chris. Any comments or questions from the directors? I had a question about why this came to the electoral areas instead of the water committee. Can, can someone recommend, remind me? Yeah, and that's because it's a uh, Comox Valley water local service area. It's it's the service area, your, your electoral areas, oh. directors determine the rates or otherwise, not the broader water committee. Okay, Director Arbor. Thanks, yeah, I, I really appreciated the constituent who brought the concerns forward. Um, I think my find, while well, the findings of the report is there may not be enough to warrant a change of policy in regards to the current situation. It, it looks like, um, I can see how for some it, it would not work as well. Um, but as this, the report indicated, the, the uh, there's other elements of, of, of equity that are built in. To, to the existing policy. And I think until we can figure our way to maintain those other elements while addressing some of the concerns, I think I won't even, I don't think I'll ask for further staff input. I think it's good that she brought it forward and that we got this report. I think it's something I'll just reflect on um, in, 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 the, in the next uh, number of times, but I wouldn't ask staff for further action on it yet. Uh, I think I, I just appreciated the concerns being brought in the staff response, but uh, this may this one may pop up again. Thank you. Yeah, I think we've been down this road before. Thank you. Thank you. So this is just on receipt. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? And that's carried. Thank you very much. We're moving on to new business. Um, are folks do folks want to break now or break go through and then break before um, you go in camera. We have one, two, two, two items, which I think shouldn't be too, too long and then in camera. Yeah, I think they shouldn't be too, too long. So let's move on then. Um, so under any business, temporary worker living accommodations, there's a correspondence for receipt. Sorry. Moved and seconded. 
And um, is it going over to staff or do you want me to speak um, to it? If you would like to speak to it, sure. uh, Director Hermier, and then I just ask Alana to be available if, in the event that you have any questions okay. or any other directors too. Great, thank you. So I know we've had this discussion a number of times around the table of um, the housing crisis in the Comox Valley um, as it pertains to rural areas um, specifically as well. Um, some of the limitations we have in areas that have ALR land and can't have you know, too many multiple houses, the cost of housing now as well. Um, so I noticed that uh, the, um, the town of Ukulich was um, conducting a pilot program allowing some of their seasonal workers to live for multiple months in, um, in RVs. And I asked staff, oh, the, the letter is asking staff to, to look into if we could do something similar here. Um, keeping in mind that our, you know, our employment is different than what it is in Euclid, but that there could be an opportunity, particularly for agricultural workers or even tourist workers, I would say, to to make take advantage of some of this type of housing um, on a seasonal basis. So um, maybe I'll ask um, Alana to to comment on on uh, what she found in Euclid and what how long this might take in terms of process. Thank you, Director Hanier. Um, through the chair to the directors, I did have a really quick conversation with staff at Euclid. Um, their need arose uh, certainly related to, to similar um, constraints, lack of affordable housing, uh, experience with seasonal businesses not being able to open because their workers and potential workers could not find housing in the community. So the item was brought forward to the District of Yukula Council by the Chamber of Commerce, uh, recommending a pilot program be instated that would see the Chamber assist property owners business owners primarily, but property owners, to um, provide temporary accommodation on their properties to, to as a stopgap measure. And so they use the temporary use permit tool, or pardon me, are going to use the temporary use permit tool. They identified a window, sort of like an amnesty, come make your application, we'll help you out with the, the process. Um, and, then, and then they're going to try it for this season. Um, nothing yet to report. I mean, it's still very early days. Uh, District of Yakula staff are relying heavily on the Chamber of Commerce to, to do the monitoring, to do the report back to council to see if this is something that they might be able to look at in the future. Some differences, of course, um, municipal servicing is in place, uh, not talking about the ALR, and very distinct needs of their seasonal operators, um, sort of a, a beginning and an end, uh, quite consistent with their, with their regular tourism, their warm month tourism industry. Thank you. Do directors have any other any comments on on that um, on staff taking some time to do that? Director Grieve. I guess uh, another one to look toward would be um, places like Whistler. Nobody can working in Whistler can afford to live in Whistler. But uh, I think we have to remember that the province has already asked us to relax policies around this sort of thing. Uh, partially because of the pandemic, partially because of housing and the economy. So um, you know, I guess it uh, would be one of those things where we're, we might almost be normalizing existing use. So in that regard, um, I can see it agriculture, but then you're dealing with ALR and, and that's a different animal as well. I think that you brought up a good point today with uh, Rob Layton and his potential campsite. I mean, you know, got workers on Mount Washington, and you're just a hop, skip, and a jump and going up the mountain from there. So, you know, it, it's worth looking into. Um, I know that there's some concern at the Black Creek Oyster Bay Water Committee today about people living semi-permanently in, in, in RVs and what have you, but, uh, you know, some of them, uh, <laughs> Some of them might be living in $250,000 RVs with Ontario licensed place, but some of the other ones, you know, it's a, it's a piece of affordable housing in some regards. And so I think it, it needs a, a little bit of a shallow dive anyway. So I'd, I'd be in support of, you said a cursory, is that what you said? Yeah, cursory, mm -hmm. a cursory re report. Okay, it sounds good to me. I'll support it. Thanks, Dr. Green, Dr. Arbor. Yeah, I'm in support as well. I guess the, uh, both the advantage of the and the inconvenience of being the area A director is I also get to watch in my whole community how the Allen Strass struggle with the exact same things around um, RVs and and 
I mean, the, the housing crisis, I think we, we've celebrated some of our successes um, this year with the coalition, but I'm afraid the, the tsunami of housing conditions is just, that's just gained strength in the province, you know, it's, um, it's create and, and, and the pandemic as well, it's creating a lot of difficult situation for a lot of residents and, uh, I'm just stunned at, at, at the escalating real estate prices and the wages are not moving much. But was it last week at condo for 2.4 million, a million over asking in Tofino? Mm -hmm. um, and Canada is just at the top of G7 in terms of those trends. So it's really tough. So my only attitude is, I mean, we talked about it our entire term the last two years, but just relax, relax, relax. The the enforcement, the, the all those things. You know, we have to take a different approach at this time, where people are. You know, the the conditions that we have are really difficult on the coast. And I know, historically in BC, we have all these bylaws and all that. But you know what? I see a lot of frustrated people out there that that say that the the bylaws and the systems we have, not just the regional district, just everywhere are not adapted to the circumstances we find ourselves in. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing it around me. I'm seeing people that, that's Hornby. So, I mean, it's not it's not the district, but, you know, people moving for, away from Vancouver because they can't afford anything, moving their family. Now they can work in, in a more rural area, but where do they live? They, they might live in some illegal uh, place at, at their parents' suite or, or at their parents' property. and. We're seeing a lot of that and that intergenerational uh, codependency that's that's reemerging, and sometimes we don't seem to have the right framework to support that in our bylaws. You know, no, it's just this is how it is, and you're not really supposed to live in your RV. And but for me, my attitude is is what I'll continue to promote. I know it it's not um, it's not in the long term sustainable to not enforce your bylaw. That's how you end up with major gaps. But in the short term, I, I, I don't want to see any stories of people really put further into housing misery because we are tackling um, issues, except in egregious situation, you know, where, where you have, and as we saw with, uh, we're in court right now, where you have egregious criminal activity, all these different things, real disruption. But um, I would just encourage us to be really, compassionate and kind during this time until until hopefully the conditions change in the next few years. Thanks, Director Arbor. Um, just one question to staff, um, to, to Alana. I know if we're, we're looking at temporary use permits for this type of activity, and generally that cost is around $1,500. Is, um, is that something we'll be looking at as well, like potentially decreasing that cost to make this a little bit more affordable? through Chair Hamir to the directors. I think what staff would want at this point would be some clarity around this action. We know based on our housing needs assessment work uh, and just you know speaking with friends, seeing listings on Craigslist, going to Saratoga where the RV counts are just chock a block. We know that we are in, a, a, we are in, I was gonna say a dire situation, but we're in a bad way, we know that. And so I guess I would just want clarity about this direction. If this is about seasonal workers and the seasonal workforce, we would look probably to our major employers. So for example, on the agricultural side, I would suggest that through the upcoming work that we're gonna, we're talking about earlier with Jody about um, having some assistance with an ag coordinator to do some outreach on our ag plan. This could be part of that work to do the consultation with farmers about their needs and and also to assess our ability. So as you know, we cannot, um, the, the ALC has a non-adhering residential policy that guides what recreational vehicle living and additional farm, um, house, farm worker housing can look like. Outside the ALR, we have some flexibility. Um, you have some flexibility with the bylaw that we have in place in our zoning. Um, so that could be if it's an agricultural piece. Uh, we did do some consultation, for example, with Ms. Mount Washington, the school board and the hospital in our housing needs assessment to see what kind of housing are folks looking for. And, and that some of that work has, has translated now to our poverty reduction assessment because we found that it wasn't just housing that was preventing workers from accepting um, positions. 
in the Comox Valley was also childcare. So that piece is unfolding there. Um, so if your interest is, is just looking at whether or not we want to do a pilot to see if RVs could be used in the Valley to address housing for anyone, then that is, I think, a separate thing rather than something targeted to seasonal farm workers. I'll open it up to, because that's opened it up again, I think. So Director Arbor. No, thanks, great comments. And uh, I mean, my, I guess my bar now is pretty low. My bar is do no harm as local government, like don't make things worse. And then if we can make things better, awesome. You know, and it's so complicated. Um, I had a constituent that told me a good one because um, she's been involved in housing issues since forever. And she says she was thinking about creating, uh, which I love the idea. It's a guide to illegal housing ethically. <laughs> So what she was talking about is if you're gonna illegal house, make sure that everything else you do is good, that you have a proper composting toilet, that you have like all these other initiatives that we have that people can actually at low cost, but don't become, you know, on the landscape and, and trigger all these other concerns. And I thought that was kind of a neat idea, even though no local government would ever publish such a game. <laughs> but the concept of how do we, help people feel like they're not, yes, they might be in breach of that in this current crisis, but they shouldn't feel ashamed or bad or all that. And again, that's going back to if we do no harm, but I saw situations where certain jurisdictions started cracking down on people in those situations. And, and they're just regular people that, that, that are just hitting challenges in their lives and they have to live in an RV. It's, you know, I don't want us to be that local government. So that the do no harm is my base. And then if we can do pilots, I mean, all the work we're doing, the housing needs assessment is fantastic. And I hear great reviews about it on the islands as well. So let's not stop. But that was my main message coming here today is I just see the situation worsen. And I wanna make sure that we don't make our residents feel like, you know, they're really running afoul of our local government and we're coming for them at some point. This is not the housing context we're in, in my opinion. So I can't state it any better than that, I think. Thanks, Director Arbor. Um, Director Grace. Well, I just wondered if this is maybe a mountain too high in some regards. I mean, it, it all, all information is good and I'm, I'm a fall for it. But I think Daniel alluded to the fact that uh, out of all the G, G7, I think Canada is uh, leads the way in, in inflation and housing, 28% over the last 18 months. That's pretty terrible. Um, so, you know, it's it's a tin can that was kicked from the feds to the province and they're kicking it down to us. And here we are operating on seven cents on the tax dollar and, and very few levers of taxation. So we, we have to somehow temper our ambitions a little bit, but uh, like I say, all information is good. So let's find out what we can. Um, Regardless of what we say around this table, it's going to go on, right? And then that leads me to think in practical terms. Um, we've been talking about a sandy dump in the Comox Valley for about 10 years, and we don't even have one yet. So if we're going to have all these RVs around, we better get on that. Thanks, Director Grace. Um, I too, like, I would love to see the the scope expanded if possible. But uh, here's why. Here's what kind of triggered me to to ask for this. Um, I know a number of farms in the Comox Valley that have been using um, either Wolf, Wolf or, or HelpX, where people who come and volunteer to, you know, volunteer their time and labor on a farm in exchange for room and board. With COVID, many of these farms were originally housing workers in their own homes. But, you know, the requirement for a separation safety-wise just for the the volunteer and for family were meaning that many of these far farms are foregoing any kind of help, which was really um, impacting production. So when I saw the idea for, you know, that was happening in Yukula, I thought, well, this might address, you know, a many of these farms to take advantage of, of an RV as, as an option for workers. Um, I, and I was under the understanding that, you know, an RV being a temporary living um, arrangement wouldn't trigger the ALC the way that another, any other type of home or expansion was. So I, I'm not sure on the, uh, 
the logistics or the legalities of that ALC wise. Is that something you'll be looking into, Alana, if, if we do go forward with this recommendation? Uh, through Chair Hanier to the directors, yes, if you uh, direct us to do this work, then that's a piece we would look at. So what is our ability within the ALR and outside of the ALR to introduce this as a use? Okay. And if, like, as Director Armour mentioned, you know, we are looking at beyond just seasonal work and we're looking at actual housing, does that still fit under the cursory review or is that going to be a more intensive look at, at our housing? I would like to suggest that... Uh... What we have today is doable within the work plan that we have because we've taken an idea that's being actioned in another community, applying it in our context within the resources that we have. And so Alana has given you advice on what's really doable because of what you heard earlier about Jody talking about the egg support worker mm -hmm. and, and having this kind of take form and take shape within that initiative. The broader discussion about loosening up regulations across the board is a huge issue that we don't have the time to address now. But having said that, we are doing a lot of background work and poverty reduction strategy and otherwise to help inform you as to the direction that may be taken on that. So, um, you know, some of the discussion today was much broader issues requiring more resources that we don't have the capacity to action as immediate as we have with the requested action here. Okay. Director Arvin? Yeah, well, I, I, I got a little bit carried away, but I, I think I got carried away on topics that are pretty meaningful to people right now. And, and I appreciate that, um, yeah, we need to move methodically. And so absolutely in favor of the requested action, the specific action. But I think whenever that topic of housing, I mean, comes up, you're bound to to hear comments because I'm just, I'm actually just relating comments from so many people I know you know, and, and the concerns they have. So, frankly, cultural and temporary and cursory review. Thank you, Director Amir, for bringing that forward. And, and I think that is very appropriate for rural areas. I also understand there's that big shift in policy at the province that many constituents don't understand as well, because it feels like they went to one side of the pendulum with the last policy and now it's heading the other way. So how does that play in our thinking? Mm -hmm in supporting people living in in, uh, in our farm communities and getting the workers we need, those are absolutely all good things. So I'm 110% behind the requested action and the rest of my comments, I will not ask an action, I'm just talking. Okay. I don't see any other comments on, on, the, um, on the letter. So on receipt, um, all in favor? Anyone opposed? And that's carried. And we have a requested action moved and seconded. And any comments on the requested action? I think we had a pretty fulsome discussion on the, on scope. I guess for Alana, whatever you can fit into the cursory would be much appreciated, even above and beyond the agriculture or temporary workers. Right? Um, is there a motion? Oh, it was okay. And um, any comments? All in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Thank you. Thanks, Alana. All right, we have the Emergency Operations Center update for receipt. Moved and seconded. Receipt. <laughs> Moved and seconded. Um, so I've just left this on the agenda to kind of give an update of, of what's been happening. I haven't been any on any calls with um, either Director or Dr. Enns. So I asked um, if if Howie could come and just give a, a, a brief report of some of the things that have been happening on his calls. Is that okay to turn it over to staff? Great. Howie, are you able to? Yes, I see you unmuted. Um, would you mind giving any comments or updates on the EOC for the directors? Um, sure, Hermit. Uh, uh, I'd be happy to. Um, and good afternoon, every uh, everybody. Um, basically, uh, the last couple of conversations that we have, I, I'm hoping that uh, you will be able to provide the um, notes that were captured by Andrea Sutherland and myself um, from the minister's call uh, last week. Um, we and uh, we did have Charmaine Ends on our emergency planning committee uh, to give us a short update. I uh, wasn't 
too long. She didn't really have much to say that, that she's just very positive about the vaccination uh, process rolling out um, and very positive that uh, it's flowing uh, really well. And um, they're getting, they're starting to getting down to the, some of the lower age groups uh, and they're very happy about that. Uh, she did uh, report on the initiative of first responders of our volunteer uh, firefighters and, and some of our emergency services volunteers. Um, though it was out of her control, there was some letters sent and uh, from what we're understanding now is that um, they are our, our fire services are being contacted directly um, to get uh, vaccinations either through um, vaccines that are left over at the end of the day. There's a list as well as some priority on the next shipment of AstraZeneca that uh, comes in. So I think that was an issue that the board was, was bored and it was hoping to happen. Um, and the only other really big thing was the concerns about roadblocks on Vancouver Island. And as of today's uh, news information that was on, uh, the roadblocks are really uh, going to be stationed um, on several key, uh, five key spots on the on, uh, on the mainland of uh, British Columbia, uh, stopping people from going up into the uh, interior um, and in uh, going kind of into the uh, Okanagan areas and up north and as uh, it was noted on that call the RCMP have set up some roadblocks and checked people um, but they're really trying to tell people to make the right choice they're really not wanting to fine and there has been no report of fines been given yet and that's uh, unless there's other questions directly that you want to ask um, that's kind of what the most rated uh, information thank you any directors have questions yeah. Well, I know the, um, that uh, Al Sebring from uh, North College and uh, brought a letter to AVICC at the beginning of this thing saying that they should uh, curtail travel on the ferries. So, but, um, you know, it's, uh, I look at Australia and what they've done there. They're very strict about traveling between states. So it, it seems to be working. But I think in Canada, um, at least what I get from talking to our our local uh, RCMP inspector is that they've got better things to do. And they can only suggest that maybe you should turn around and go back. Thanks for that. Director Arbert, any questions? Yeah, uh, thanks. The Yeah, I guess we're... First of all, I just want to say I appreciate the continued efforts around all these things and... Uh, continue to publish the videos and all these different things are are good. I think I think the Comox Valley has been the regional district has had a really good response since the beginning of COVID. I'm not saying that just to sing our own praises, but I, I really think that you guys have done a good job in coordinating between all the different uh, municipalities and areas. Um, yeah, I think it, it's been really good. We're again in a new uncertain environment. Um, we know the summer will be better. A lot of us will be vaccinated. I got my vaccine last week. Um, but as the CEO said earlier today, informally, you know, you just don't know with the variants. We don't know what the future holds. Um, so for me, I go back again. A, a part that's never part of emergency operations center is that mental health and activity part. And, uh, and, and I'm hopeful that as we head into strategic planning for the district, we will tie some of these things together to an emergency response and in a recovery phase. We're not a recovery phase where we need to rebuild houses <laughs> because they've gone down to earthquake or fires or anything like that. And a lot of it is outside the role of local government, but we also know that if we're not involved, we won't see real change on the ground if we just leave it up to the province and federal government. So still a lot of unanswered question looking past summer. But, uh, but I think we can do it. I think, you know, I think the leadership that Howie and his team, the responsiveness, if I look even in my own communities of you guys to Hornby and Denman needs, con connecting with the community, having initiatives, th this has all been not only noticed by me, but noticed by our residents. So I, I hope we stay flexible and, and, uh, and responsive while trying to keep within our mandate. So job well done. And thanks for keeping that thread going with the uh, operation center. Right.
Thanks, Dr. Arbor. And Howie, just one question for me, um, and I've, I've neglected to forward your email, so I've just done it now to the, the other directors so they can see the points that you made. But regarding the messaging around travel restrictions, I'm wondering how, what is the relationship between the EOC and organizations like TBI or, or any other groups that are doing messaging around tourism? Is there a connection there? Or, and if so, like what, what kind of messaging has been going back and forth? Uh, uh, Chair Armier, there is no really connection there. What we are looking for is really the provincial messaging that uh, we were supporting, uh, which is really coming out of um, uh, the public health uh, officer's direction. Um, and we try to, you know, uh, again, do our part in supporting that uh, initiative. I, I do have some, you know, some, uh, we do look at some of the good information that's come. We do work with our counterparts like BC Ferries and they've confirmed with us that numbers coming to the island um, have decreased, uh, you know, and, and um, we're also seeing that, you know, numbers of, of travel drop to our locations. Um, but yeah, we're, there is a bit of disconnect from the uh, tourism industry. We don't know if their hotels are turning people away. Um, that's, um, that's something that we, you know, we'd like to find out. But again, we don't have that straight connection at our, at our table. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I don't know if there is a way that we can connect um, some of either through ERTF or through TBI, um, at least to get information back and forth. Is there... Are staff aware of any kind of conduit for this type of information? Um, just that uh, TVI and others are really well connected in their own um, associations or otherwise as to what the best practices are. And um, um, we, we, we kind of rely on that. Our, as how we sort of indicated, our, our efforts are to reiterate the, the messaging from the province, but not necessarily in, in, enforce or ensure that that's being done by various individuals, groups, or organizations within the community. We're, we're, we're there to help spread the message, but not necessarily follow up. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Any other comments, questions? Okay. On receipt. All in favor? Any opposed? And that's carried. Uh, I don't think we have any other addendum items to, to approve. Okay. So we have a motion to move in camera then under um, section 91K of the community charter. Moved, Second. seconded, and all in favor? All right, and we will...